Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to extend a very warm welcome and a thank you to all of you for joining us today. Next slide. My name is Jeanette Stewart, and I am the founder of Translation Commons. We at Translation Commons are excited to host today a celebration of the International Day of World's Indigenous Peoples. We are honored today to have the participation of experts from various fields who will share their knowledge and experiences. We are honored to have a wonderful volunteer staff that is producing the event. We are grateful to each and every one of you for your time, energy, and thoughtful participation. Next slide. Our first guest opening the celebration of the International Day of World's Indigenous Peoples is Dr. Siva Prasad, former professor of anthropology at the University of Hyderabad and currently an honorary professor in the Center for Digital Learning, Training and Resources. Dr. Siva Prasad has both teaching and research experience on more than 40 years, during which he guided research students in diverse areas. He is actively associated with UNESCO IFAP programs, and he's a member of the Information Ethics Workings Group of UNESCO Information for All program. Siva, thank you for joining us and delivering the opening address. Thank you, thank you, uh, Jeanette. I must first of all thank uh, uh, the Translation Commons for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it is a very important day uh, for all of us because indigenous uh, people are, though in terms of population size, they're smaller, but in terms of their contribution to the uh, planet, uh, health of the planet was tremendous. Now, if we look at, because they are known by different names uh, in different places, some places they are called first peoples, some uh, or some in places they are called as Aboriginal peoples, native peoples. In India, they are known as Adivasis or Janjatis, also in Nepal. And uh, now, if we really look at the uh, population of uh, the indigenous communities, they form just six percent of the world population, living in more than 90 countries. And uh, in fact, vast majority of the uh, indigenous communities live in uh, Asia, especially. And what is important for us to keep in mind is multilingualism and multiculturalism is the hallmark of the indigenous peoples. They belong to more than 5,000 indigenous uh, speaking uh, indigenous people or indigenous communities speaking more than 4,000 languages. In fact, very important uh, thing to keep in mind is though the rights of indigenous peoples are clearly stated in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples adopted in 2007, they are highly marginalized and face discrimination in many countries. They constitute about 15% of the world's extremely poor people. And they also suffer higher rates of land alienation, displacement, landlessness, malnutrition, and uh, threat to their very existence itself. Now, if you look at uh, indigenous communities, uh, it is important for us to understand that uh, their knowledge, indigenous knowledge, is very crucial for safeguarding the world's uh, environment. Due to their traditional ecological and cultural knowledge, actually they have been protecting about 80% of the so far remaining world's biodiversity. This is most important for us to remember. Though they are just 6%, they are protecting the existing, 80% uh, of the existing uh, world biodiversity. Therefore, the local cultural or indigenous knowledge and preservation of their languages are crucial for 
sustainable development and to protect the world's natural resources. Now, their languages and cultures are constantly under threat due to many factors that we all know, like many of them are oral cultures or oral languages, no written scripts, and uh, but survived for centuries, but they are under threat because of the expanding uh, you know, uh, capital and other kinds of things. And so the dominant languages also play an important role in, uh, in their decline. So most of the endangered languages and cultures, if you really look at it, they all belong to, or most of them belong to indigenous people. So endangerment of a language threatens their identity and they, it majorly contributes to the disappearance of the knowledge and also contributes to the subsistence or sustenance of the natural and uh, environmental resources. And it is widely noted that climate change, deforestation, pollution, development, and loss of diversity pose a serious threat to the survival of the indigenous people uh, due to the loss of traditional knowledge, disintegrating traditional governance structures and their cultures. It was observed by the United Nations Department of Economics and Social Affairs in its write-up. Uh, uh, and what is important to remember is that the survival of the indigenous peoples and their knowledge system is vital, not only for meeting the sustainable development goals of 2030, but also for mitigating the effects of climate change. So what are the major concerns that we have is indigenous people have lower levels of education with high rates of dropouts. This is due to lack of educational programs in their languages, culturally inappropriate kind of curricula, lack of infrastructure, uh, etc. And all the more, women face structural forms of violence and discrimination. The rates of maternal mortality are also very high among the indigenous communities. Human trafficking is another important aspect that is facing the indigenous people. The infrastructure and development projects are threatening the lives of the indigenous communities uh, with displacement and, uh, of course, rehabilitation doesn't take place. Because by the time they are rehabilitated, they're again displaced. So indigenous people all over the world, more so in the South and Southeast Asia, where major uh, part of them live, face increasing challenges because of rapid development, climate change, deforestation, displacement and lack of recognition of their traditional practices. In fact, sometimes they're even uh, looked upon as a criminal kind of things because the, many of their laws are not in tune with the national laws. Therefore, what is uh, specific to them may not be specific to the uh, national laws. Therefore, they get criminalized. And thereby, they are also denied their traditional rights. So UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous uh, People, it says that they have right to freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development and right to self-determination. Besides, they have an equal right to govern themselves. These are only in the books, but in reality, they are not happening. So a role of, uh, if you really look at the role of Indigenous youth, this is a, a kind of a, a beacon of light to some extent because it is the indigenous youth who have been playing a very active role uh, if you look at it today as agents of change, basically to preserve and promote their languages and also cultural knowledge. They are also harnessing and using the new technologies to offer sustainable solutions to mitigate myriad of problems faced by the indigenous community and also playing an active role in exercising right to self-determination. In fact, they are taking a lead in empowerment of the communities, promoting skill development and entrepreneurship, promoting the language using digital technology and social media. So they are playing a lead role in raising the issues that are of prime concern to the indigenous communities, welfare and development. So uh, to conclude broadly, what we need to do is we need to pay attention to protect, preserve, and promote indigenous languages 
and their knowledge systems. Their right to determine the way they would like to chart out the course of their advancement need to be restored. Their rights over resources and right to govern themselves are important to be restored uh, because that is important for uh, bringing a balance between the nature and people for a healthy environment for a sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Siva. Um, we are now moving on. Next slide, please. Um, to our panel discussion, uh, which is going to be around revitalizing indigenous languages and culture. The moderator is Dr. Yudaya Narayana Singh, professor in Amity University, Haryana. Um, with seven collections of poems in Maithili and Bangla, six books of essays and 12 plays, he has translated many books and published 250 research papers and has created 545 documentaries on the language, literature and culture of Bangla, Tamil, Kannada and Marathi. Udaya, thank you for uh, joining us. Um, we are moving on to the next slide. The panelists are Mr. Ravi Ragrata and Dr. Gadud Susanto. Uh, Udaya, would you like to start the panel discussion? Thank you, uh, Jeanette. And uh, let me uh, begin by raising a few issues which come out of what Professor Shiva Prasad has just now underscored uh, very, you know, creatively and very interestingly. You know, the, uh, there was a time uh, before 2009 when we all met in Iceland, about 50 linguists and culture studies people met in Iceland. And we decided that we must actually revisit the whole world's situation, language situation, and create a world atlas for languages facing threat of extinction. And to be able to do that, we built a team of 30 editors worldwide. And our leader was Chris Musley from BBC. And the result, all of us know, is the UNESCO's uh, World Languages in Danger Atlas. Now, even before the atlas came into the being, there was prediction, there were seven predictions. One came from one of our participants in Iceland, David Crystal. Another came from a biomathematician called Pajel, that by 2050, 90% of world's endangered languages or indigenous languages will disappear. Now that's a great threat. And we then started looking at the whole world very carefully. And we found that already uh, in Siberia, Alaska, uh, 45 out of 50 languages disappeared. In USA and Canada, uh, 149 out of 187 languages went away, completely vanished. Uh, in South America, 110 out of 400 languages gone. The South America, Opportunity is doing much better. In Australia, 90% of languages, that is 225 languages, have completely wiped off. And in Russia, 45 out of 65 languages are gone. Now, there is therefore a lot of uh, violence and rupture in the way our languages have been treated. And as Shiva rightly said, that sometimes it is the market forces which tell us what's happening. Sometimes it is the killer languages within court, the major languages which are really dictate the terms. And as a result, it's, it's a big issue uh, before us. Now, we are talking about revitalization of languages. We want to change. We want to change the situation. We want to sustain our languages, our cultures, our communities. And we want to see if we can arrest this decay and decline. Who doesn't want to change? Everybody wants to change. 
uh, we all aim to change, but uh, the problem is that uh, you know the future that we are talking about or the past history that we are talking about, quite often we are not allowed to create our own history. It is assumed that history means past. By the 12th century French interpretation and 14th century interpretation of the world history is not necessarily exactly the same, not about the past. Okay, so can we make a change? Now, there are many, many fictions which are very dystopic fictions which have come about uh, painting a very bleak future of our communities. And we will discuss these issues with two of our experts, one working in the Indian scenario, another working in the Indonesian scenario to know what's actually happening. What are they doing? Are their own experiences telling us that the community they are working with are actually producing young people who can arrest this change, we can make this change, stop this change. Uh, before I ask Ravi to open the innings, let me uh, end this introduction with a story. I think uh, this is very interesting to, to see what exactly is the situation about this kind of dystopia. Now, to tell you the story, imagine a time and a place where love is considered to be a disease. It is perhaps a deadlier pandemic than COVID-19 for which one must find a cure. This is exactly what you can see in Lauren Oliver's dystopic fiction and film called Delirium. Many of you may have seen the film Delirium. This is about an alternative United States where the borders are closed to outsiders, approved cities are walled off from surrounding countryside because love must be prevented at any cost from spreading. But the doctors in this alternative USA has found a cure. They must operate upon all those who are reaching an adulthood, which must, they must undergo a surgery of the brain that prevents them from feeling love, not an optional surgery. Everybody, US president says, everybody must be cured because there are powerful desires such as love to prompt citizens to engage in emotional violent behavior. So this must be somehow contained. And this film, we see that there is this protagonist called Lena, who is looking forward to the cure to be very happy. But everyone who has experienced love has been unhappy. Her mother committed suicide. Her sister got infected very early. Another cousin, Marcia, died from the stress. So as a high school senior, Lena says she must perform very well in a test where she must confirm to the acceptable pattern of loveless, pure life. But at the end of the film, we see that Lena fails. She's not cured. How do we know? Because she actually falls in love with Alex, an invalid person who lives outside the city wall. Then she finds that she must dig out more about herself, whatever she has learned from the past, and then finds out that what she had learned about the past is completely false. Her entire childhood was a lie. Now, we have been promised an equality. We have been promised a constitution. We have been promised an equal behavior. And this is true of Bangladesh, of Pakistan, of Nepal, of India, all of us that there is a constitution which guarantees our protection. But what is happening is that we are uh, you know, almost not able to implement that in spirit. In letter, yes, they're there. But in spirit, we are not able to implement. So let me ask uh, Dr. Ravi uh, how exactly he views this issue of preservation and maintenance of language. Uh, what exactly has been his experience in, in, in energizing many of these indigenous communities to preserve their languages? Thank you, Dr. Uday. Uh, I'll start with a little introduction of uh, myself, just for uh, everybody. 
uh, I am basically uh, a social worker who did my post graduation in rural development and went to the village uh, way back in 87 and uh, just spent time with the people, moved from village to village, and you know, spent 34 years working with the tribal communities. Um, what's interesting is that. Um, Language, yes, language is such an important thing. Uh, what I found in, so most of our work has been on rights of tribal people. And we won a landmark judgment called the Samatha judgment in 1997. There were only, there's only one judgment. Actually, there were two judgments. One was Mabo in Australia and the other was Samatha in India that came in the favor of indigenous people in the last century around the world. And uh, Mabo was overturned by the court, but Samta still remains, though it is not implemented like Dr. Uday said in, in spirit or later. So that's our, well, it's basically activism that took us there and, you know, and, and we realized there's a lot more things that we need to learn. And um, so that's being my introduction. We, in our course of these 34 years, we also went into running a school for tribal children for 10 years, uh, where, where we had children from five language groups. And the first, uh, the, in the morning, they all sit under the tree and sing songs in their language for one hour because we found that even in in our when we fought the samta judgment there were a few villages many villages or communities and in which there were three villages that had they were from kondadura community who had a language and uh, frankly speaking i tell you uh, there were 15 other villages which which didn't have a language of their own so it was easier for the for the opposite parties i mean the companies or the government or whoever to divide the people in the 15 villages but in the three villages that had a language uh, they just could not divide and so therefore we won the judgment and we are still with the community after 25 years and they still retain their language so one thing that we realized is that a, a, a language actually is everything. I mean, it, it, is, it is like, if you don't have a language, you get assimilated into the mainstream or whatever, like Telugu, for example, is my state. So you are assimilated into Telugu. But looking at it, all of us in India who have gone through, we should at least know three languages, your mother tongue, Hindi, and English. For a tribal person, he has to know four languages. His mother tongue, Telugu, or whatever dominant language of the, of the state, Hindi, and English. So unless they learn this, they can't really move forward in society. That is one part. The other part is that if the language dies, then everything, like Dr. Shiva said, the knowledge dies. For example, uh, and a uh, very simple thing, like when we were running this school for tribal children, they were all very small children between 6 to 14. And one day during October, uh, during Dasara time, all the children early morning around 6.30, they were all picking up something in the, in the, in the farm. And so I ran out saying, fearing that they might be picking up poisonous mushrooms because October you get these mushrooms or toadstools or, you know, things like that. So, but this small girl explained to me saying, don't worry, we know what we are picking. This is edible and this is not edible. Now, she was just seven years old, sir. Imagine uh, somebody who's actually studying mushrooms. Uh, I know of somebody who passed away, mother and, and, and daughter in Himalayas, way back, 20 years back, were doing. she was doing research on mushrooms. And they picked up some mushrooms and they, they thought they were edible. And both the mother and the child has passed away. But out here in the tribal communities, everywhere across in India, 
various seasons they pick up these mushrooms which are edible and and how does this girl know that's because of a language that's because of their parents she or you know she said my my grandmother and my mother told me how how what to pick up and what not to pick up so you see that's a knowledge so language ke sath, along with the language comes the knowledge it's a package so once the language is lost then the idiom is lost and okay. so i still have people uh, that i work in the tribal areas where who speak in an old type of telugu so he normally will only speak in riddles he never answers in a straight way it's very interesting uh, so but we have lost it now you know we we don't know those idioms but he still speaks only in idioms so it's a kind of a language that actually holds it's an identity and it's something that uh, i mean it's like yeah it's it's a very serious thing actually if you think of it unfortunately development has pushed all these aside and it's like a road roller rolling over all these people and today unfortunately there's no adivasi person maybe there are adivasi people here but then let me tell you i work with them and they are really really upset on this point dr uday that the constitution everything is there but nothing actually happens actually uh, ravi i think the one of the most important point that is uh, that they point out is that they are unable to write they can speak they can dance they can perform but they are unable to write and that pain of not being able to write is something which is uh, causing them uh, havoc and particularly in the education sector scenario it's a, it's a great disadvantage i know the similar situations are in there in indonesia uh, malaysia and several other countries uh, you know when the india census began in 1901 uh, we were told that we have 170 languages for dialects then onwards in all census operations we have only been hearing about the mother tongues and today we have 1652 mother tongues and 1796 other mother tongues we don't know what they are so what is the situation uh, i would like to know from dr gatut susanto in indonesia i know that hero and his associates have been doing wonderful work on recording documenting indonesian smaller languages but what is your take on that dr susanto you have to unmute yourself Okay, good evening everyone. Uh yes, already uh 9 9:30 p.m. here in in my place. So <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation to joining this event uh which is uh sharing the current situation in Indonesia uh, about the indigenous languages. As everybody know, which is Indonesia uh consists of more than 1000 ethnic group. which is i mean it's a belong their own culture and at the same time indonesia also has more than 700 indigenous languages which is this is the complicated uh, situation in indonesia and we also realize which is i mean currently we also uh, experience uh, losing uh, you know indigenous languages mostly in eastern part of indonesia uh the strategy which is uh, right now uh, you know which is i mean uh, how we preserve the indigenous language and culture in indonesia we uh, in indonesia uh, follow the five steps of preserve, uh, preserving indigenous languages which is uh, number one is uh, like uh, doing mapping which is the documenting the result of language and literature and number two is uh vitalization which is studying the vitality of language and number three is the conservation which is the uh, which is even though not um not many indigenous languages but this is to try somehow to make the manuscript from the oral and printed the literature something like that and also uh, as we discussed today which is we focus on the revitalization 
So like a learning log language, uh, like uh, you know, like using classical and using like modeling, for example, using uh, developing a le lesson plan, like providing, uh, you know, like creating language uh, grammar and also like, uh, you know, like uh, making a dictionary, uh, making like language uh, festival. And number five is the registration. So we try to make some uh, registration uh, for the indigenous uh, languages in Indonesia. And uh, from my perspective, which is um, from outside, which is from government, from academician, uh, from uh, you know, researcher, says they're doing a lot of how to preserve the indigenous language in Indonesia. But however, the situation is uh, with the local community, with the local, in, uh, with the indigenous people, uh, less proud of using uh, the indigenous languages. This is, uh, I see, this is kind of the biggest uh, problem. Uh, they prefer, uh, because I mean, as you know, which is uh, Indonesian as a national language, which is not supposed to be the threat and uh, that indigenous language, but in fact, and also there is the complication. So kind of the, because this is the successful of uh, making Indonesian as international language, but also there is an effect, which is uh, for the children, for the, in the entire, the host family and the community, for example, they uh, prefer to use Indonesian. And as the result, uh, uh, time to time, finally they forgot uh, how to use the uh, local uh, languages, the indigenous languages. And I think this is one of the reasons why the indigenous languages can disappear. And yeah. uh, the, uh, here in this context, uh, I have a question for you. You know, the question is, uh, as we see in the Australian survey and other surveys, Canadian surveys, that the older generation people are able to retain the language still. And some those who are the middle age, they have already started forgetting the language. And people who are very young uh, are unable to speak the language at all. So there is this problem of intergenerational, you know, passing on of the baton, uh, as it, as I say in the language of sports. So the habits, the rituals, the folklore, the performances, are they or are they not able to transfer to the younger people in your in your country? <laughs> Yes, uh, for the uh, major indigenous language, uh, luckily that's happened. So that's why the major indigenous languages, I mean, like kind of still vital, still stronger. But however, like the smaller indigenous languages, because I mean, uh, the proof of the performance, the literature, like the play or something like that is uh, very limited. So like the way how to identify this one and how to spread out that one among the community itself. So for example, in the member of the family, because uh, for example, uh, there is uh, indigenous languages only spoken um, not more than 500 uh, people. So uh, this is uh, like uh, the big problem. So when, for example, uh, but the thing is, I mean, uh, in my idea, if the family, did the children uh, how, to, how to communicate at least uh, speaking an uh, ability uh, because in Indonesia, which is, I mean, not all indigenous languages has written. So this is also one of the way how to protect, uh, how to pretend uh, like, you know, like other language uh, laws. So uh, for example, in Japanese, yes, uh, in Japanese, uh, there is a situation, for example, for young generation cannot speak uh, the the up level of language, which is uh, usually is spoken uh, in the, during the performance and puppet performance, for example. So for example, during the puppet performance, only the old generation uh, understand uh, what they're talking about uh, during the story in the puppet performance. But for the young generation, usually they don't understand uh, what, they, what the talent is talking about. And that's why, for example, in the puppet performance, uh, how to carry out the story as opposed to be uh, to use the what you call the high level of Japanese, but there is a part of the clown season, what we call is a koro koro, try to switch in the uh, 
regular uh, language. So to make the younger generation understand that situation. And also, yeah, yeah so that is the situation, for example, in Japanese. Uh, and even worse, actually, I mean, uh, we are talking about the indigenous languages in Eastern part of Indonesia, because the, for example, the performance, the play, the literature, you know, uh, we cannot even define them. Right. Thank you. Uh, now, in this context, uh, Ravi uh, should come in and tell us, uh, are we able to identify some leaders from among the indigenous communities who can own the, the responsibility of protecting, promoting, and developing themselves and their own communities? Because this is very crucial. If the younger generation takes the lead, then a lot of changes can happen. So what is your experience on um, well, yeah, there is a positive experience. I think in the next session, uh, Mr. Yadaya will uh, come in and present what right. we're doing together. Um, here, the idea is to um, um, propagate their songs and their idioms and things like that with the children. And he has a very nice presentation on that. So there are younger people who can be uh, oriented and there are leaders, yes, there are people like the, the teachers who are going uh, uh, along with, uh, I mean, part of Yadaya's group, Koitur Bata, are going into the villages and to the schools, sitting with them and doing these kind of language kind of uh, workshops or, you know, singing and dancing. So these teachers are the leaders in one sense, they are the language leaders or the language leads. Um, so that should be popularized. Uh, this is, we are doing it for one language, but there are many languages, as you know. So in every language, there is a possibility. For example, Savara language has a lot, like we had a chief minister also from, um, from Orissa, who was from a Savara uh, tribe, Gridar Gumang. Yeah, so, I, I do remember, I do remember that from the total language in West Bengal, which has only 1,200 speakers. We have great singers and poets like Dhaniram Toto, who got the Padma Shri Award this year. So there are, uh, you know, you are right, there are uh, some communities which are very active. And of course, there are some state governments also, which are very proactive towards protecting and promoting the smaller languages. Like in Nagaland, for instance, all the 20 plus languages they have been using in the school education. Uh, and education, if you once bring languages into the school, then so in Indonesia, for instance, uh, what exactly is the experience? Are these languages uh, being uh, used in school? Because Papua New Guinea, for instance, decided that they will use all the 700 plus languages into the school system. What is Indonesian experience? Well, <clears throat> Uh, in Indonesian situation, uh, the local language which is used uh, teaching in school is the major indigenous languages, such so, as Japanese, uh, Sundanese. Uh, this one uh, is uh, teach in school from the elementary school, which is uh, this is uh, decided by government as a local wisdom uh, for uh, teaching the local languages. However, for other indigenous languages, which is, for example, in eastern part of Indonesia, not teaching in school. So uh, this is the another problem. And as you said before, so the situation, uh, because the, the ethnic group has different uh, type of what you call uh, the strategy. So like the mostly like the eastern part of Indonesia, because there is uh, what you call like, uh, like the leader, and it's really depend on the authority of the leader. So like how often they are doing the ceremony, how often they are doing, for example, the celebration, how often they, for example, they singing a song, something like that, which is, I mean, all the event will use the language. That is uh, the, what do you call, that is the good, uh, the good point of how to maintain the local languages uh, over there. And- Yeah, I mean, this is very crucial because one of our uh, viewers, Stephen Loomis, is asking the same question. How to raise the leadership? What should we do to identify and to prepare the 
next generation leaders to motivate them to be active so is there some kind of uh, voluntary work that is happening uh, in many of these countries okay uh, uh this is uh, kind of the strategy which is because i mean uh, all the effort also need the financial which is uh, for example the research talking like language uh, particular documentary or something like that need to cooperate with the leader in that area so there is a spot fund for him for her uh, for doing this one so for example uh, they can uh, uh, they can have the ceremony they can have this one so this is like the way how to keep alive the situation over there so people from outside uh, can contribute uh, how to uh, keep alive the local language and culture over there. But again and again, uh, it's really depend on their own community. Uh, they willing, uh, what do you call it? So need the wisdom from the leader over there, which is the local language, the culture is very, very important for them. And yeah, uh, but yeah, this is this is a very crucial point, uh, uh, Dr. Susanto. And uh, I just wanted to bring in Ravi here. What is your experience? Because uh, outsiders, uh, able linguists, capable planners, uh, you know, social, uh, you know, uh, sociologists, they do tell uh, the communities how to go about, how to progress. But uh, the basic point has to come up from within the community. And uh, there is another issue here, Ravi. Uh, there is there are a lot of songs, the performances, the rituals. You know, our today's films, today's uh, big uh, budget shows, today's television programs, they make use of many of the indigenous language uh, products and they market them. Uh, but the in return, the communities quite often don't get anything. Uh, they don't get either the name or the credit or anything. So what is your uh, uh, take on, on this issue of uh, complicated issue though, but what is your suggestion? It seems to be a constant problem. Actually, I once was hearing Dr. Madhav Gadgil in the Social Science uh, Forum on, on the whole issue of plagiarization. Uh, so, so it's very interesting to see how, yes, popular tunes or, or music or terms, you know, are, are picked up from the indigenous people, including, for example, I have a friend who does some very high-end um, alcohol from Goa, but he sources the Mahua from, from the tribal communities in Orissa and, you know, Andhra Pradesh. So my question to them has been morally don't you owe something to their people there because the mova comes from there so it's a tough question sir uh, the answer is not straight but one thing about leadership i think um, uh, in the next session yadayak will come with some very good uh, uh, pointers on how uh, you know how leadership can be developed but i would just add uh, from my experience that if we actually uh, create um, programs and things like that by using the local leadership on language, then it really gets something. The there other is, thing there is, is there is another problem. There is another problem, Ravi. That is now it's the time of digital transformation. Now almost yeah. everybody has a cell phone. Everybody has a smartphone, and even this younger generation. Uh, you know, uh, indigenous members of the communities, they too have them. So what, and they are also using social media. So what exactly is happening there? See, there, the problem is that everything is getting mainstream. Frankly speaking, uh, we have a dance called Dimsa, and there is a kind of a music instrument, three, four music instruments that are used. And I found now there's a new term in the villages called Disco Dimsa. So I said, what is this Disco Dimsa? So Disco Dimsa does away with the, with the subtle nuances that the older people used to have of slowing down and going up and going down, which was normal. Here, the Disco Dimsa is like a constant. It's like, it's like some trance music. I mean, I'm just trying to compare uh, for lack of something. 
so it's like a very constant thing so therefore the influence of movies and uh, mainstream music on the local uh, rituals and local music is is already happening sir and digital yes many of our tribal uh, youth are youtubers and you know they are they are into tiktok and yes there is a, a lot of youth getting into this so i guess we should target uh, some digital programs also so then the youth will slowly start one good thing that we have seen is that people try to develop scripts for their language which is unnecessary according to me uh, though i respect uh, the this thing to make a language popular if it is telugu then and my language is koya then i write koya in telugu lipi that's okay. easier for okay. me than to create a koya language now who is going to take koya language forward telugu is already there it's like how in olden days when we had the teleprinters in 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 our uh, uh, newspaper offices uh, uh, you know i used to get uh, like telugu article typed in english right but you, then you know and, there are there are some communities like santal for instance yeah now they were writing in several scripts some were writing in odia script some were writing in bangla script some in roman script but uh, one of the scholars from among the community decided that they must have their own script so they decided and they discovered or they deciphered uh, the created old chiki script old chiki now yeah. now they want everybody to write in old chiki although there are sort of controversies about that but uh, from here let me just give you a little bit and ask uh, dr susanto about the uh, marketing of the indigenous uh, ideas indigenous you know medicines and indigenous products uh, is there something like that happening where they this connected with their livelihood if they can be connected uh, can they, if they can see profit coming to them because of their livelihood because of their practices they will be motivated to retain many of those old practices so what is your uh, experience there in indonesia right so uh uh like this to said also like the strategy i mean uh, as a question before which is i mean uh, have to do five versa before uh, we uh, tend to translate all from the local languages into indonesian and now have to be uh, reversed not only translated from from local languages to indonesian but also from indonesian to local languages and the uh, product as to be distributed to the nang community which is i mean even uh, could be in book form or could be in digital form this could be benefit from the uh, uh, for would be benefit for the community over there and for the local product which is uh, connected with the economy uh, we also swing this one. so for example uh, during the uh, the big event in bali like, like last year uh we also uh, uh try to give uh as a gift uh for like all visitors uh, uh in in bali uh which is a story a book story which is i mean indonesian local languages of there and that's also something a good something a benefit from the local community uh again the problem is only happen for uh, like in the major indigenous languages which is still did not touch uh, and the small uh, local languages not so in smaller think, not in smaller yeah. languages yeah. right 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 That's, so i yeah, think yeah. uh we should think uh what is could be benefit from the local community uh which is the indigenous languages uh, over there uh so would be the local people would be would be uh, happy uh having this uh, development i think yeah i think the one of the problems that i notice uh, in dealing with this uh, the situation of indigenous language culture and communities is that we have a lot of stereotypes in our mind uh, that they are very moody people that they, are, that they they won't listen to us that you know they are not really amenable to planning uh, that they won't cooperate So all kind of uh, ideas are floating 
And I think we should, uh, we should really uh, say that they are actually uh, opposite. They're not this kind of stereotype, which is being propagated in the mainstream literature quite often. Uh, I think the, that is something, if you want to comment on that, uh, Ravi is smiling, so I was wondering whether he had some anecdote to talk about this kind of uh, stereotyping uh, effort, effect. Yeah, yes, the, 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 the major, that's a very nice point you pointed out, sir. Um, stereotyping is a major problem. And it's a problem for the mainstream, actually. Uh, it's not so much of a problem for the indigenous communities. But it is how the media sees it, how an academician sees, how a bureaucrat views. So these views and these opinions seem to be, yeah, I have one anecdote, which I can quote from 1989, actually. Um, uh, there was this old person I met in the forest who, who asked me, what is Bofors? So I anyway, cutting a long story short, um, he was a very intelligent person. He was an old guy from 1920s. And, and he made a comment which said, the Britishers were better. So I said, why? Why is so? He says, for the Britishers, all we Indians were Indians. But now, when I go to the office of the sub-collector, he asked me whether are you ST, are you SC, are you this or are you that. So if I don't belong to his community, he doesn't do my work. But yeah, those days when, when the Britishers were there, for him, uh, the everybody was equal. Right. So that way, really, this is very crucial. Yeah. 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 He also said one thing about the buffers. He said, you see, the Britishers are better because they looted the world, but they took the money back to their country. <laughs> so, right. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. I know, you know, the uh, one of the questions that came up during the uh, our discussion, uh, Hillary Kelly is asking, uh, do we, does Ken Bond definitely say which are the indigenous languages of Himachal Pradesh? Actually, uh, the problem with uh, languages and mother tongues and dialects is it's a very uh, volatile situation. What is to be defined as language? What is to be defined as dialects and languages? And Himachal Pradesh, where uh, some of us have worked, like I have worked with a colleague of mine from Uppsala University, Sweden, on the Himachali languages. Uh, we can tell you more about it some other time. But uh, today, we had a very profitable discussion so far. So I would like uh, uh, Dr. Susanto to make some closing remarks, if he wish to have, uh, to how to how to exactly revitalize the indigenous uh, communities. And then we will ask Ravi to make a closing remark and we will then wrap it up. Dr. Susanto. Okay. So uh, as a conclusion, which is, uh, this is very important to preserve indigenous languages and its own culture uh, in Indonesia, because this is like the mirror of the plurality of Indonesia. So uh, somehow from outside, from inside, have to cooperate together. Uh, so uh, we can, what uh, So we can, we can keep uh, this uh, rich of the country uh, as as stated in the symbol of nationalism, Pinika Tunggal Ika, which is different uh, all united. So, but uh, even though all different, but we can united. So, uh, so uh, if we able to keep this one, is this is uh, the. Uh, we have to we have to struggle together to keep this situation so we keep the plurality uh, for the united thank you okay thank you and dr ravi now yeah yes sir i would say that um, in india there's a lot of active i mean a lot of work going on on languages from by different people and i, I think, think we all should there should be a lot more discussion first point a lot more uh, 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 you know meeting and and discussion among people who are already studying, I, I coming from the field, so I would want I would want a synergy between the the, the academics and the practitioners like right. Yadaya right. and others. So if there is a combination, I would feel I feel that that gives a 
a different angle to language and identity and preservation thank you yeah i think to conclude this session we had a very fruitful discussion i would mainly identify that uh, there are four kind of barriers for any of these uh, language and social and cultural development we have the barrier uh, such as geographical barrier we know that many of our indigenous communities indigenous languages are located in the northeastern side of india so uh, so numerous numerical strength and weakness is a big problem and location of geography is also another big problem because the mountains water bodies forests all these are very crucial and uh, what we see in indian situation i'm sure that's also true of others that uh, 96% of our people uh, you know speak only 4% languages which are our major languages uh, you know the the uh, the people the problem is that there are this political barriers there is social barriers and now after digital age has started coming there is this information barrier uh, today's network society all the news is coming in the major languages of the world all the things are happening films are being made ut an ot platform uh, programs are being made in the major languages of india and major languages of the world so the smaller languages have uh, of course because at least in india 176 uh, smaller languages are available on the radio network but then uh, they don't have they don't have community radio network. so that's a big problem uh, so this is a very crucial and uh, i think these barriers is something which we have to learn to overcome and uh, uh, we are very grateful to the translation commons for uh, making it possible for a panel discussion on how to revitalize our languages our culture our economics our community and uh, i would definitely say that uh, what a modest beginning could be a video uh, if we can take this up as a challenge because we have 1000 universities in india i'm sure the explosion of universities also in indonesia and other countries in bangladesh so many uh, universities have come up if they can take up this issue of community radio movement for the indigenous languages and communities uh, that is something which will perhaps make it possible for dislocated speakers of those languages to be able to hear good uh, you know performance in their language to be able to somehow connect with them because another big issue is that the speakers of the same language are not living in one place they are all scattered because of today's livelihood issues and other countries and uh, philippines has some very good community radio network from you know situation we should really uh, learn from others how to go about and do this so thank you janet for uh, giving us this opportunity I want to thank our uh, uh, very knowledgeable um, uh, panelist and moderator for sharing your insights in a very, very interesting discussion. And I hope that we can hear more and uh, you, you will have the opportunity in future events to share more of your insights. Thank you so much. Our next session is a, a, a couple of cultural performances from indigenous communities. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the first uh, uh, performance is going to be from Ms. Sang Doma Tamang from the Tamang community. Uh, she will sing for us a traditional Tamang song called Amaila Ho Jan Kailala. And uh, there will be a a uh, traditional tamang instrument player indira lal tamang daso kepula hi everyone this is sangro matamo And and myself, we are going to present 
Tama chela sa song, Dhamma Lingla Thunsa, which means creation of world. This song is composed by the Hawa Wangel Tamong from Sindhupal Chuk, Nepal. He said that he got inspired by one of her traditional instruments, Dangfu, which I'm playing in the video. The chorus of the song, Hammaile Hai Hammaile, Hammaile Hai Khailala, is one of the most important, important chorus as it holds history. Back then, when Dangfu was designed by Pem Dorji Tamong, he used to play and sing far into the wood in memory of his late mother. Remembering all his pain and grievances, songwriters and composer remarked this line or a chorus as the most significant in any Tamang traditional song. I got the opportunity to learn this masterpiece of Dawa Wangel Saw back in 2021 when I was one of the contestants in Miss Tamang World. We have another important musical instrument called Tungna which my brother is playing in the video. These two instruments are more than enough for a Tamang song to sound beautiful. They say no one can resist dancing on their bed. If you have seen Tamang traditional dance, you can feel the liveliness, bliss, never-ending steps and togetherness among the dancers. They also say even non-dancers, introvert people, groove listening to our beat. We are so much rich in culture and tradition, even with the meaningful works our ancestors have done. Woman empowerment concept was there since our history. Our mothers are powerful. They even led women to hold political powers. Likewise, our ornaments, our foods, festivals are created to celebrate womanhood, togetherness and peace. Um, the performance is available if you uh, and uploaded on the Translation Commons YouTube. Uh, you can uh, uh, catch it uh, at any time. 
as well as this entire event. Uh, after it finishes, you can also rewind and watch uh, various elements of it. Our next performance is by Ms. Hessel Saru from the Munda tribe of India. Uh, she will recite a poem for us in the Mundari language. The poem is called Urum, and there will be a commentary in English by Mr. Gunjal Ikir Munda from the Tribal Health Collaborative of Anamaya. Hessel? You are muted. Can let me see if I can help you unmute. You will need to unmute for yourself. No, we still can't hear you. Upka mic khulia. Can you talk? Sunai de raha hai? Ji, yes. No. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Urum. Ain tanale bir burure menaga alea hatutuka sakie kana hatu rutunte urumina munda jatite hatutala mena tale akara jojo umbul subare rasike nale jao negere Hon upon jia jai, bano o chilen chipitane huding marang. Saasomay jete jargi, mena atale susun durang, tola kana ain arite, durang nalle susun nalle jile radega. Ba batauli karam mage phagu, mana tingale chandu hisem, din mundi teba janre, akidele tapan ili, guari yele sing bunga. Dodo Mayele, Bonga Cocha, Manating Tanale, Birburu, Gara, Beda, Ikir, Ote de Sum, Jogao Lekako, Bogi Leka, Hatinge Canale, Kilire, Menaa, de Sum Nile Rimbil, Latar, Neage, Alea, Samorum, Lekan de Sum, Neage, Alea, Rupa Likan Gamae Johar. Yep. Shall I go ahead with a commentary? Please, Gunjal. Okay, yeah. So uh, uh, Urum actually means uh, identity. So uh, I mean, in the whole poem, it was identity uh, about the tribe. Uh, the language, the culture. So I've come with a rough translation. I mean, I might have missed many things, but it's a rough translation anyway. So it goes something like that, like this. <clears throat> yeah, uh, we live among the nature. Uh, we have our villages named and identified in our language. We have Akra. Akra is a community space where uh, almost all the important meetings, the dances, uh, important decisions regarding running of the whole villages, all uh, whole villages taken uh, there, it's a uh, space. So we have Akra beneath the tamarind tree. We celebrate happiness here, grandmother, grandchild and all. Uh, in all weather and seasons, we have our uh, songs and dance. Uh, we sing and dance and feel happy and content. Uh, we have numerous festivals, uh, which we celebrate in different seasons. Uh, we pray to spirits and our ancestors for the well-being of all. Uh, we believe in trees and forests, hills, valleys and rivers, uh, which we will keep intact. The blue sky, this earth, uh, is our happy world, is our golden world. So this is what uh, uh, she meant by when she described the whole poem. So thank you. Thank you very much to both of you for sharing such a cultural treasure. Thank you. Uh, moving on with our program, uh, our next session is going to have a series of presenters, all uh, presenting topics on the indigenous languages with a spotlight in South and Southeast Asia. Our moderator 
is Dr. Jandiala Prabhakar Rao. And um, he has, uh, um, uh, he is a professor of linguistics at the University of Hyderabad, India member of India. Uh, his research areas of interest include linguistics, translation studies, foreign language teaching, digital learning, and higher education in India with special focus on internationalization of higher education. Prabhakar, please start the session. Thank you, Jenny. So we will straight away uh, go to the business. So the, our first presenter is uh, Teja Pandey. Uh, he is lead and strategic communication and design in Anamaya, uh, the health, the tribal health collaborative uh, thing. And he is a cultural producer and he works on projects related to information design, visual cultures, urban policy, etc. And he will be making presentation on increasing access to human, increasing access to health information by translating literature and media into indigenous languages of India, Aishwasan campaign and beyond. The, the floor is yours, Mr. Teja. Thank you so much, Mr. Rao, for the introduction. Um, I'll just give me a minute while I share my screen and again uh, get started with the presentation right away. You have 10 minutes to make presentation. Absolutely. All right. So I'm assuming that you are able to see my screen and I'll start my presentation. Um, so <clears throat> as the title suggests, uh, I'm going to talk about how understanding um, some of the work that we've been able to do in the space of public health has allowed us to create uh, health information, public health information um, that can be tailored to the needs of certain tribal communities that we work with. And this presentation has been, although uh, I'm presenting, um, this is a, a collaborative work of me and my colleague, whose name is Tathakata Basu, uh, who's also part of uh, this webinar. I believe she's listening in right now. And we both uh, represent Anamai, the Tribal Health Collaborative. So um, uh, to understand some of the basics of public health communication, why is it important? Because it allows us to impact um, individual community and public health related outcomes. And how do we do it? We, um, we put together a set of multidisciplinary practices which are geared towards different, uh, different communities, different individuals uh, who have specific health related needs. And we address those needs by providing customized information, uh, context specific information that is aimed at influencing their behavior or influencing their thinking about certain health related ideas, right? Um, so that they, they might uh, be able to change their behavior over time. And <clears throat> there are very few essentials that we need to keep in mind that allow us to actually do that, right? So <clears throat> having a strategic purpose in mind is very, uh, is very important. It's most fundamental. And a part of that is having a clear call to action. So if, uh, let's say we want to eradicate polio um, from the face of planet Earth, um, making sure that people are able to administer uh, the necessary medication, uh, the vaccine for polio, is a clear call to action, right? So it's very simple, It's uh, which is what I'm talking about in the next bullet point, which is that simple messaging is actually very crucial to make sure that people remember what they're supposed to do, right? Um, <clears throat> it is equally important as we have simple messaging, it's important to have simple yet attractive formats that people are likely to remember. Um, we produce this, uh, this content in ways that is uh, familiar and relevant to the way that communities understand and absorb information. So that may be in print, that may be in audio or video as the case may be. And it needs to be produced in languages that are actually spoken and understood by communities. So how are we, uh, how do we do 
um, with regards to this particular aspect of of languages that communities speak, right? In our experience in public health communication, what we found is that um, <clears throat> communities speak a variety of languages that allow them e the easiest possible access to services, right? But very often what happens is that people who speak the dominant languages or state languages or the official languages as the case may be, they often um, begin to conflate this uh, the, this sort of code switching between their uh, sort of spoken language and the transactional language as fluency. And that brings in a certain kind of uh, complacency in terms of public health communication design, right? So very often what happens is that um, the products and services that are being designed are only designed in the dominant language. And the people who do not speak that language with certain fluency or in a certain manner, certain vocabulary, certain uh, accent even very often, they begin, they, they are threatened with the exclusion of not being able to avail certain services. And that in the context of public health is extremely important. So why is it important for us to think about it? Because we work predominantly with tribal communities, right? Um, the, the three numbers to the side should give you a very quick indication as to the kind of linguistic diversity that we deal with. We don't work obviously with all 700 plus languages, but we, um, but we work with a linguistic diversity enough that has um, that has ensured that we think about it while we design our communication material. Now, when we look at the the state produced material uh, in terms of health communication, it is predominantly in the official languages of the country or the or the state languages, right? So here you can see messaging around TB and polio. That's all in Hindi. Uh, here you can see the banner, to, the poster to the left is in Marathi. It's about polio. The middle one is about sickle cell anemia, which is in Gujarati. And the right one, which is on HIV AIDS, is uh, a community, is uh, sort of a leaflet in Bangla. Right? Now, very often we find that state languages get covered sort of well, depending on the program and the, and the ministry that they are dealing with. What gets left behind um, are the people who do not read certain languages. They might just speak them. So there are lots of gaps that begin to uh, that begin to form, and this is the gap that we were we were very uh, sort of cognizant of and were working with um, when we designed the Ashwasan campaign. So it was a hundred day active case finding campaign that was designed to uh, to sort of fight the spread and impact of tuberculosis predominantly in tribal communities. So it was implemented across one hundred and seventy four districts. Uh, where more than 10 million people were screened by community influencers within their respective villages and communities. And as a result of this campaign, that more than 10,000 new TB cases were diagnosed and they were registered in the, um, um, in the public uh, healthcare sort of surveillance system. And the treatment has been initiated for most of them. So <clears throat> one of the things that we, that, um, the, that helped us decide how to choose languages that we um, that we needed to produce our our uh, campaign material in was one was obviously what do communities generally speak in a particular district or in a particular block, and the other one and the other indicator was what is the requirement that is being communicated by state health officials with whom we were implementing this campaign at every step of the way. So for certain districts, we found that the the demand was far better articulated than others. Um, and we sort of responded accordingly by producing um, content and making sure that, um, that we are able to reach out to communities in as many ways as possible, linguistically speaking, right? So here you can see that the same leaflet has been produced in say four different languages. So you have Mizo, Boro, Santali, and Khasi um, uh, in, the, in the Latin script and the, uh, and the Devnagri script uh, as they, as they uh, sort of request. <clears throat> we also wanted to make sure that not only just print, but our audio video media, we at least begin to produce in languages that were not just English or not just Hindi, right? So the video that you see, the animated video uh, that you see here with the person's chest uh, so illustrated um, was, uh, was uh, originally produced in English, which we then translated into three languages just to begin with, which was in Bodo, Hindi and Marathi as a test case. Our training material for, um, for community influencers and health workers, we were also able to translate that in Hindi and Marathi. Uh, and we sort of, uh, and we shared it in, on the field. 
Uh, and there was obviously a version that existed in English. That was the uh, that was the original version of this of this video that was produced. Um, what this allowed us to do um, is <clears throat> at the end of the campaign, we were able to create IC material, uh, printed IC material in 25 languages. So non-tribal languages, which are the state languages uh, that you see uh, listed in the left column at the bottom, were nine in total, and the tribal languages 16 in total, which um, which was a huge sort of surge in the um, in the diversity of languages that we were able to work with at such a short notice, right? Um, the, res the, the response to this attempt at, um, at producing content in languages that communities appreciated uh, was appreciated by um, the, the state machinery as well as the communities as well, as you can see in the two quotes um, that I've just cited here. Um, and that, so that kind of, so that was an encouragement for us from the community side, and that was also an encouragement and tacit agreement from the, uh, from the uh, public healthcare system side, where we could get, we could become bolder in our ambition uh, to have a larger, um, sort of uh, a larger footprint in terms of the content that we are able to produce in in a diverse in a diversity of languages uh, where we work. Right? Yes, yes, so, you have only um, one minute. You have only one minute. I'm at the end of my presentation. Understood. Thank you. Um, so the uh, the project uh, that we started with, which was the Ashwasan campaign, resulted in th those uh, this plan called TB Free Districts, where we were working in seventy-five districts. In uh, we will be working. Sorry. Um, uh, uh, with a lot more emphasis and our uh, communications um, <clears throat> strategy is responding to it by creating material um, uh, that is printed and audio video in um, in a in a larger number of of languages that uh, tribal communities speak whom we work with we would also be ramping up the training material that we use um, to work with uh, community influencers and health workers and community media that we are able to produce is also translated in languages that people can access. One of the ways in which that we are doing it is actually creating a network of translators across regions whom we can work with on a, on a recurring basis, um, which has been, which was one of the biggest learnings for us during our Ashwazan campaign that we had, we were really scrambling to make sure that we are, that we are working with people whom, um, whose accessibility is sort of reliable for us, right? Um, and that is and that is something that we'll be taking forward um, over the next few years. I'm happy to talk about the translations work that we are doing and the network that we are building uh, offline. And thank you for this opportunity. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Tejas. Uh, you, you are doing a very good work, very practical one, useful one. So I wish all success in your endeavors. The next presentation by Dr. Ganesh Birua. He belongs to the O-Tribe uh, community of Odisha, India. And uh, he has he is working for the whole language script Waran Chitti project 2030. And he is a postgraduate student. So now the floor is to Dr. Ganesh Biroa. Uh, Dr. Ganesh. Thank you. You have 10 minutes, please. Yes. Yes. Uh, Johar, uh, I am Ganesh Biroa, belong to uh, the whole tribal community of Odisha State. In the, and I am a postgraduate student. Uh, I love creating online content um, and it's my hobby. Uh, since 2017, uh, I am working for the whole language script, Varanchiti. Uh, I am now to about uh, the internet when I step out uh, of the village for higher education. Uh, for the first time in uh, 2013, I found out uh, about our script, Varanchiti, uh, on Facebook. I was excited to learn our script and immediately tried to search on Google, uh, but I could not find the Varanjati related content. Uh, 
So uh, from uh, 2019, I started mission to uh, 2030 and try to uh, change the content. Also, I started working on Instagram, uh, Twitter, YouTube, and blog. Uh, the first month of two, 2021 was the happiest day for me uh, because I come to now uh, that the support of Varanjit script has been started on Android version 11. Uh, and uh, other people have helped me a lot in the uh, taking this project uh, forward, uh, some by making a font and some by making a keyword. Uh, so uh, some uh, challenges for whole language. Uh, right now, the biggest challenges of the community is to see a uh, whole keyword as a default keyword on uh, mobile uh, because all the keywords that are uh, they are now are uh, third party applications uh, due, due to which people are not able to install their mobile easily. Uh, I have a a video on YouTube uh, about uh, set of keyword on mobile. Uh, in that, uh, many people ask uh, questions. So I think uh, uh, people are uh, facing uh, difficulties. Uh, uh, another challenge in our society, uh, most of uh, the video content is being made uh, on entertainment. Uh, so I think. Uh, along with that education content is also necessary for the uh, society. Uh, last changes, uh, since there is uh, a community trying uh, not being accepted on Wikimedia Commons. Uh, my new project. Uh, now uh, I am collecting whole expressive words and uh, uh, collected more than 100 words till now. Uh, then Ganesh, I have been. Uh, Ganesh, just I am interrupting you. You have to tell the organizers when they have to change the slide. Okay? Continue. Ganesh, are you there? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, network problem. Okay, okay, no problem. Uh, but please tell when, uh, I when have... they have to change the slide. Okay, please continue. Yes. Um, uh, then uh, uh, I have been uh, writing articles on uh, Janam Dasar for a long time, uh, which is related to culture. Um, uh, this 70% uh, of this uh, culture has become extinct and uh, uh, there is also a research part in it. Uh, so it is uh, taking more time. Uh, I believe we have some problems uh, with uh, the presenters network. Um, we will have the slides available for viewers and audiences. And uh, perhaps uh, uh, if uh, the network improves, we can uh, uh, repeat this or perhaps in a future uh, event. Um, Prabhahar, should we move on to the next presenter? I believe that the next presenter is Hiro. Uh, different slide. Yes. 
and um, a very brief introduction. I, Prabhakar, I don't know if you are. Yeah, yeah, can you can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yes, next next we have a joint presentation. The first presenter is Hero, who is a PhD student at Victoria University of Wellington, and he is doing research on four the languages of Indonesia, and he is from Language Agency of East Java Province, Indonesia. The next presenter who is making jointly making presentation with Hero is Avaluddin Rusin, Rusindi. He is also from Language Agency of uh, Java Province, uh, province. and uh, the title of their presentation is Bringing Knowledge to the Indigenous People, Translations into Indigenous Languages in Indonesia. So, Hero, now the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Rao. I assume that you can see my screen now. So, first of all, uh, first of all we would like to thank the organizer for this great opportunity. Uh, my name is Hero Patrianto, and with my other two colleagues, uh, Dr. Katsun and, and Mr. Awal Mursiandi, we would like to talk about how translation practices can be a way to bring knowledge to the indigenous people in Indonesia through their own languages. So every indigenous language has their own unique vocabularies that express the rich local culture and knowledge. Uh, this rich local, will, uh, local wisdom is so valuable that it needs to be kept alive among its community and also to be shared to any other different community. And related to this, a challenge will surface when we look at the other side of the same coin, which is when an indigenous community want to learn others' culture or knowledge. In the case of Indonesia, the national language has been the language for people to get to know different culture or knowledge from other communities or cultures. A similar situation happens to the text of science and technology. Uh, these texts are usually available in foreign languages, mostly English or Indonesian language. By the law, Indonesian language is the language of instruction at schools. Uh, regulation also allow foreign languages to be used to deliver knowledge if the languages can help bring the knowledge to the people with more ease. Now, when it comes to the indigenous language, a question may arise whether an indigenous language will ever have an opportunity to be used in texts of science and technology whether an indigenous language will ever be a language of choice to bring knowledge from other world to the speakers of that indigenous language. Uh, some publication we have found in Indonesia indicate that it is not impossible to have an indigenous language to be a language of science and technology. Unfortunately, we only found those publications from big indigenous languages of Indonesia, such as Javanese, Sundanese, or Balinese. We have found several magazines published in Japanese that provide general articles, uh, short stories, poetry, as well as texts of science, though they are not very technical. Uh, we also found magazines in Balinese and Sundanese, but the magazines in these two languages mostly contain of literary works. Other than those big indigenous languages, especially Japanese, uh, science texts written in indigenous languages are very rare. And in this paper, we would like to propose a translation as a strategy uh, to provide science text in indigenous languages. This strategy has been applied by the Indi Indonesian government. Uh, in this presentation, we would like to bring you two examples. First, the, the COVID-19 related material, and secondly, the STEAM theme children's stories. So let's begin with the COVID-19 material. When the COVID-19 situation was getting worse in Indonesia, the government initiated a translation project for the protocol guidance originally written in Indonesian language. Indeed, the COVID-19 has brought us the most frightening experience, but uh, from the perspective of indigenous languages in Indonesia, this pandemic has triggered some positive reaction. So during the efforts to fight COVID-19, the government thought that they needed to change the communication strategy since information related to COVID-19 was not well received by people. So the government then decided to translate the COVID-19 protocol guidance into indigenous languages, more than 100 languages according to the National Language Agency. Some big, uh, some big languages like Malay, Japanese, and Sundanese also have versions in different dialects. 
This is, I think, the first massive indigenous language translation project in a very short period ever happened in Indonesia. This multilingualism project was carried out by 30 language offices throughout Indonesia. Unfortunately, the government could only manage to provide the translation in 104 indigenous languages, despite the fact that Indonesia have more than 700 languages. Nevertheless, we were happy that we could cover indigenous languages from the western to the eastern part of Indonesia, from Sumatra to Papua. Not only the major indig indigenous languages, but, but also many small indigenous languages. Uh, through this trans translation practice, indigenous people were able to access scientific terminologies through their indigenous languages. Words like uh, comorbid, vitamin, virus, or immunity are some untranslatable terms. With additional description, uh, these scientific terms could be explained through the indigenous languages so that people will accept the, the terminologies and understand them very well within their indigenous cognition. Uh, some technical terms have their equivalences in indigenous languages like hypertension or obesity. This will encourage people to be more confident in reading texts of science in their own languages and later on demand more texts of science to be available in their own languages. Uh, next, my colleague Awalud Rusiandi will discuss the second example of translation practice into indigenous languages, which is the STEAM theme children's stories. Please carry on. Okay, uh, thank you, Hero, for the opportunity to continue presenting our paper. Uh, dear participants and chairs, good evening from Indonesia. My name is Rusiandi, and please allow me to talk about STEAM theme children's stories. Uh, as part of this presentation. <clears throat> so, uh, the aim of this children's story work is to project it as a local language preservation in Indonesia that's suitable with the local context. Moreover, this project is trying to combine uh, the local context along with uh, theme based in children's stories, uh, that is science, technology, uh, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Uh, therefore, it is providing knowledge uh, to indigenous people through children's stories. Uh, since the stories are for children in early and beginner stage, uh, the terminology of STEAM used are not too sophisticated or complicated uh, to make them understand easily. Uh, for example, uh, introducing children to autotomy concept in a story about magic tale of a gecko in indigenous languages. So it's the ability of a gecko uh, to separate body parts. Uh, it's called autotomy. Uh, the project itself is in bilingual children's stories. Uh, they are in Indonesian and indigenous language. Uh, in a web-based application called Panjaring, as you can all see uh, on the side of the text, there are approximately 958 children books for early and beginner readers. Uh, around 123 books have been translated into several indigenous languages in Indonesia. Uh, and all of the indigenous language uh, translators are contributors. Uh, therefore, it is very delightful to know that there are many people still care about indigenous languages in Indonesia. Uh, however, it is also an irony to know that uh, of the around 700 indigenous languages in Indonesia, the stories are not translated to all of those indigenous languages. So only uh, on the major indigenous languages in Indonesia, the translation stories are available. Uh, despite the inequality in the indigenous languages translation products, uh, we are trying our best to provide reading materials for children in Indonesia. Uh, we are providing bilingual children books translated to indigenous languages that they are already accustomed to. Uh, as an example, in 2023, uh, we have 110 children's stories published in 2000 and 
23, uh, namely 22 Middle East stories, uh, nine Eastern stories, and 79 Japanese stories. Those are from East Java province only. Uh, there are a total of 85 authors, consisting of 17 medalists for Ushing and 64 Japanese authors. So, during the project, it's fascinating, it's fascinating to know that uh, for most indigenous people in Indonesia, it's easier for them to write in Indonesian rather than in their indigenous language. Uh, from the stories, we can identify that the indigenous version is the translation product since there are many words that sound too Indonesian. Therefore, uh, the stories are written in Indonesian then translated to indigenous languages. Uh, uh, as, a, as a closing statement and something to think about uh, as a take home message, indigenous languages are rarely used in science texts. And second, indigenous people have difficulties in accessing science and knowledge via their indigenous languages. And the third is indigenous people have faced challenges in providing science facts in their indigenous languages. And then translation can be a strategy to provide science facts in indigenous languages. And last, translation can be a strategy to enrich indigenous languages is vocabularies. Uh, terima kasih. Uh, thank you to you all. Thank you, Hero, Aududdin, and, and Sister Antop. I think you have brought once again to the fore very important uh, issue that uh, having science in indigenous languages. It's a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Now we will move to the presentation of Dr. Alam Korshed, uh, who is the director of Bistar Chittagong, uh, Art, Chittagong Arts Complex. And uh, very interesting that he is a mechanical engineering turned into turned writer, translator, and cultural curator. Uh, and then uh, uh, he has also authored more than 25 books in Bengali, mostly works of translation and literature, literary essays. So the title of his presentation is A Brief Description of Chakma Literature and Translation. So I request now uh, Dr. Alam to make his presentation. Dr. Alam, you have 10 minutes, please. At the very outset, I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude for inviting me to speak on this auspicious occasion, World Indigenous Peoples Day 2023. And I thank UNESCO and Translation Commons for putting up this international symposium on the topic of indigenous community, focusing particularly on South and Southeast Asia. Uh, let me admit in the very outset that I'm not an expert or an academic on this issue per se. I apologize. I will start the video again. Uh, there was a glitch with my sharing of the screen. I will start it again. Can you see my screen now? Good day, everyone. Uh, let me begin by introducing myself. I am Alam Kurshid speaking from Chittagong, Bangladesh. At the very outset, I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude for inviting me to speak on this auspicious occasion, World Indigenous Peoples Day 2023. 
And I thank UNESCO and Translation Commons for putting up this international symposium on the topic of indigenous community, focusing particularly on South and Southeast Asia. Uh, let me admit in the very outset that I'm not an expert or an academic on this issue per se, but as a translator myself and a critique and a, a cultural activist, and also for the advantage of being a resident of Chittagong, a very nearby community from this uh, Chittagong hill tracks, where most of the indigenous people live in Bangladesh, I generally take an interest on this uh, issue, like indigenous people, their lifestyle, their culture, their language, literature, and also the state of translation of their uh, literary works. Uh, uh, taking this advantage, uh, I would like to say a few words about the topic I have selected tonight, which is the Chakma community, their language, literature, and its translation. Bangladesh has about 2 million indigenous people, both living on mountain areas, which is called Chittagong Hill Tracks, and also in the plain land of other parts of Bangladesh. And uh, around 45 communities have been identified so far, uh, with as much as uh, 30 to 40 separate languages being spoken by them. Chakma is by far the largest community with a population of nearly 300,000, and they have a language of their own, which has also a script, which is not very common uh, in this indigenous languages. Most of them have their language, they speak, but not, not many of them has a uh, script of their own. The Chakma script is called Ojatara. Uh, and uh, in terms of anthropological information, these community have uh, migrated to Bangladesh, particularly in Chittagong Hill Tracks area, roughly around uh, 400 years before, uh, mostly from the adjacent uh, Myanmar or the Burma uh, and uh, other uh, nearby regions. And they have embraced uh, Buddhism as a religion. They speak the language, which is precisely known as Changma, not really Chakma, Changma language, which is a kind of affinity uh, with some dialects of Chittagonian language, the Plainland language in Chittagong. Uh, so much so that there is an understanding uh, that this is basically an, an ultimate culminating point of the Chittagong language, Chittagonian language which uh, linguists like uh, Dr. Shuniti Kumar Chatterjee, Dr. Uh, Shuhidullah, they have also kind of uh, agreed to this proposition, though this is not uh, really entirely acceptable by the community. And there are uh, some debates going on, but this proposition has some merits on it because uh, Chittagonian people can understand Changma language and Chakma people can also understand their language. Um, but the script, if you say the, the script wise, this uh, old Chakma script is not really in use these days. Uh, but it used to be used uh, quite uh, frequently in earlier days uh, in their religious texts. Uh, like Gozen Lama, that's a uh, very earlier uh, literary text by uh, poet uh, Shipcharan, and also uh, those uh, play, the cultural play called like uh, Radhamon Dhanapodi. Uh, they used to be used by their uh, indigenous healers community to write down their uh, 
medicinal prescriptions and description of the plants. Um, Genkuli, a, a community uh, of wandering birds, uh, preaching love and uh, songs of uh, harmony. Uh, they used to use this uh, language. Likewise, uh, Ubu Giti and Uli Giti uh, song writers and singers, and uh, also in uh, many other um, uh, ancient texts, uh, we, we find this script. But these days, honestly, uh, we rarely see this script being used to express their uh, literary uh, human. Uh, what happens mostly, uh, there, there are a proliferation of uh, Chakma literature, no doubt about it, poems and stories and songs, uh, but uh, most of them use either Bangla script uh, or some even use Roman script to write those down. And then someone, uh, either uh, he or she, uh, translates into Bengali uh, because they are also well conversant in Bengali language, uh, or uh, they collaborate with then, uh, someone uh, Bengali speaking uh, friends or uh, a uh, colleague to translate that in Bengali. This is the, the predominant scene. And I, I, I can name uh, quite a few texts in uh, regards to this, like Kavita Chakma. Uh, she has a poetry collection book called Joli no Udhim Kittei. Uh, she has uh, translated this both uh, into Bangla and English in a um, single volume uh, collection. Uh, in Bangla, it calls Joli Udbuna Kano, and in English, it uh, it's known as why mustn't I flare out? Uh, similarly, another one, uh, Shamari Chakma. She also uh, did a wonderful job a few years back, like in um, 2018. She collected an uh, oral history of the people, those lost their uh, livelihood, their homes, their lands due to that great inundation which happened in 19, uh, around 62, 63 the hydroelectric dam in Kaptai, uh, and the whole community was wiped out and they had to uh, leave the country, uh, made in great exodus to either Agartala or Mizoram or Urunachal. And Samari Chakma traveled to those faraway lands, collected that story, of course, in, in their own mother tongue. And uh, uh, she wrote it down in, uh, in her own uh, Changma language translated a few of them Bangla herself and also a friend of uh, her, uh, like Naeem Mohaimin, um, based in um, uh, New York, teaching at the Columbia University. He did some translation of it and presented it a few years back in a documentary film and, and a presentation in, in Chobi Mela in Dhaka. So this is the predominant picture. And same thing happens to many other uh, writers like Mrittika Chakma, uh, Mukul Talab. They also write in... Um, Sikh Gandhi Pankor, they also write in the original Chakman language. Uh, there's no doubt, doubt about it, but writes in, uh, in, in the Mangla script. And this is the reality uh, that they have to do, go uh, with a phenomenon called uh, diaglossia, diaglossia, two languages. It's, it's a common scenario. And maybe this, this is uh, um, becoming triglossia. They have to learn their own language, Chakman language, the Bangla language, and English. And uh, accepting this reality, I think they can uh, do a good job in uh, creating awareness of the literature, in translating it, in uh, sustaining it in, in a larger scale. Because the Chakma uh, people has the um, has highest higher uh, literacy rate than the average national rate of Bangladesh, and a lot of people are in uh, overseas and uh, they are uh, conversing in many other languages, in English and French and other languages, so they can do this translation. And in Bangladesh, I think we have the responsibility to make sure that the mother language uh, is uh, preserved and we should provide, at least in the primary level, uh, the education through the mother tongue and this uh, interactions between uh, the main mainstream community and the overseas community and using technology, this uh, digital technology, um, I think uh, this translation uh, should happen in a more uh, in a vigorous uh, way and uh, make their presence felt both in terms of their 
existence, their uh, influence in the society, and also in terms of their uh, the asset of uh, uh, creative expression, language, and uh, cultural output, and, uh, and, and knowledge. And that's the way forward uh, in terms of uh, my humble uh, opinion, observation. I think I'm uh, getting slightly over the time allotted to me, so I, uh, I better stop it here. And I thank once again everyone for giving me a patient hearing and for invite, inviting me to speak on this occasion. Thanks once again. Thank you, Dr. Alam Koshin, for your uh, exciting presentation. And uh, now we will move to Dr. Samar Sinha. Next presentation by Dr. Samar Sinha from Sikkim University. He is uh, heading currently the Center for Endangered Languages and Sikkim's Endangered Languages Documentation Project at Sikkim University. And he is also founder member and currently assistant treasurer of formal studies in syntax and semantics of Indian Languages Society. So now I request Dr. Samar to make his presentation. Samar, you have 10 minutes time for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Rao. Uh, with, in the same breath, I would like to thank Janet from Translation Commons and Professor Yuan Singh for providing this opportunity to speak on indigenous languages of Sikkim and North Bengal. Uh, this is just an outline of my talk that I'm going to present uh, tonight. And I'll be talking basically about a uh, geographic area, which we popularly uh, call it as Dazzling and Sikkim Himalayas. And it contains both foothills, hills, as well as plains. And we do have borders across these two uh, geographic locations, Dazzling particularly and Sikkim. At the same time, we are into a one biodiversity zone and we belong to a single li linguistic ecology with shared history, culture, and demography. In other sense, if you can identify, we can call it as a micro-linguistic area where we have Indo-Aryan, Tibeto-Burman, Austroasiatic, and Dravidian languages. In this scenario with the indigenous population, if you look at their languages, and if you look at the distribution of languages within India, what we can find is that this hotspot model is being presented over here. And if you look into this language hotspot model following Anderson and Harris in 2006, we can locate that Darjeeling and Sikkim Himalayas is a part of a Eastern Indian language hotspot where there is a high level of endangerment. There is a genetic diversity in terms of language family. At the same time, there is very low level of documentation of either writing system, grammar, dictionaries, or even of technological resources. However, this model is designed to assess the threat of extinction, as well as to track and visualize what is going on, as well as to prioritize research on these endangered languages of the indigenous communities. So Darjeeling and Sikkim Himalayas, which is uh, known for a biology, cultural diversity in terms of nature, and culture, as well as in language. If you look into the linguistic scenario, we have a mosaic of linguistic diversity, community language, also of language endangerment. So we do find languages which are endangered, which are safe, which are moribund, which are also heritage languages. At the same time, as I work in the field also, we do have certain adventures at times we've discover new languages. At times we find multiple names of the same language. At same times we find hoax claims as well also. Now, if you look into this area linguistically, you will find more than 34 languages. In fact, 33 and 34 that I have outnumbered collects a large number of languages. And if you count all these numbers or number of languages, it is going to be more than 40 languages which are spoken in this area. However, there are languages like Singh Saba or Kagate, which are still unknown to many of us because we only know through the community. However, in the case of Rokdung, I'll be presenting later on. 
And there are geographical distributions also. Some of the languages in the black are distributed in the plains and green languages are safer languages than other blue and red, and as well as uh, one which is in magenta. Now, if you look at the population of Sikkim, it is very small, just of six lakhs plus population, and 73% of the population speaks Nepali, which is uh, one of the central languages of India, as well as the state official language. But there are 26% of population which do speak non scheduled languages. And interestingly, Sikkim is the only state, most probably in the country, in India, which has got 12 official languages. And out of 12 official languages, Bhotia, Lepcha, Limbu, Rai, Serpa, Tamang, they are classified as other under census of India, whereas Gurung, Newar, Magar, Sunwar as other, despite being official languages. So if you look into it, all these languages, which are the languages of the indigenous communities, are actually endangered languages. So what we find by giving them the status, even as an state official languages, they are not going to be out of the endangered languages. They are still the endangered languages. So what we can correlate is that indigenous languages are also endangered languages of the region. But it is not the only story of language. So it's about the script. If you look into Southeast Asia or even in South Asia, scripts are a very important part of our identity. In the earlier panel discussion, we heard a little bit about scripts and we can have one script for other, but it is not. It is only a majority and thinking only that we can have one script, like one language. But if you look and if you go and work with the communities, then they do have issues with the script. I'll give you an example. When we, uh, when uh, one of the scripts was proposed for a language uh, based on the Devanagari, it was not been accepted by the community because once you accept as Devanagari, you are identifying that script with Nepali language, or in larger context, you may identify with Hindi or maybe with other. So therefore, the communities they try to develop their own script. At times, they have developed new scripts, which we call it as custom scripts. Uh, or at the same time, there were existing scripts which were there in the community, maybe 100 years back or maybe 50 years back, and they are reviving these scripts. So if you look into the language endangerment along with the script endangerment, 85% of world is not granted and it's not taught. And major issues, uh, Professor uh, Yuan Singh was also making about that they don't have their own writing system. I think that's one level. So I would like to see that it's the language, uh, it's not only the language hotspot, but our places also belongs to script hotspots. So this is in parallel with the language hotspot. When there is a high level of endangerment, there's a high diversity of, of in terms of script, and there is low level of documentation of these, of these scripts. So if you look at the correlation between endangered language and script, you can find it very clearly, which is there in the slides in red. All the languages, official languages, other than Nepali in Sikkim are endangered and their scripts are also endangered. Some of these scripts are traditional scripts like Sambota, Rong, Srijanga, which are more than 100 years old or even more than that. But there are some scripts like Zetisa or Kripa Salyan, which have been, or Kharpa, they are being customed, customized, what we call it as custom scripts of uh, Sikkim. They are newly developed script and Kharpa, in fact, I'll be talking later on also. However, there are also other languages like Kulung, which is endangered. Of course, they decided to use the Devanagari. Of course, uh, script is Devanagari, but the orthographic practices are different from that of Nepali or Hindi or any other uh, languages. Similarly, Mazi is another endangered, which is supposed to be dead uh, in Sikkim, and they don't have script. And another language which has been ignored, though they belong to an indigenous population of the state, of Sikkim as well as of North Bengal is of Indian Sign Language. The regional sign languages are highly endangered as they are um, continue to, uh, it doesn't pass from one generation to another. It has to pass through one community, from community to community with of the deaf people. So I think it's also very important for us to look into script as well as uh, sign language also in the issues of language endangerment, as well as in terms of script endangerment, as well as in terms of indigenous people. Dr. Samuel, you have one minute, please. One minute. Yeah. 
And the previous studies have shown that languages have been highly endangered. And there are also initiatives like by constituting Sikkim's Board of Indigenous Languages, as well as of uh, International uh, Kirat Rai Linguistic and Cultural Research Center in Sikkim. And there are also efforts from in Sikkim University where one of my PhD students completed a grammar of Kulum, which is based on her community language, uh, among which well, she faced it as an incremental endangered because the Rai language, which is also the community of our larger community, was recognized as state language. Similarly, uh, there was a case of uh, language uh, revitalization of Bujel language in Sikkim by another scholar, Vishnu uh, Bujel, who recently submitted his uh, and got awarded. He's the person who has developed this Karpai script along with his mentor. And uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, this script and the language on the basis of his initiative has been recently uh, accepted as one of the scheduled languages of Sikkim, making it the 12th official language of Sikkim. And Center for Endangered Languages had played a very high role, especially in language documentation and Center has always taken initiative to create a native uh, speaker linguist like Vishnu or Rina, or even the discovery of a new language. We found a new language called Rogdun of one of the Rai languages, which is not spoken anywhere, but only in Sikkim. It is a language which is distinct from Bantawa and other languages. Similarly, we created technological resources, which can be downloaded from our Sikkim University website. And as a matter of pride, I should be saying it very loudly that we have the first created, the first archive of the endangered languages in India, which we call it as Sidela, Sikkim Darjeeling Himalayan Endangered Language Archive. So we work from area from the field to archive. And these are some of our publications, grammar and dictionaries so far, and work has been continued. However, we do face that census of India doesn't give a proper, as there is a lot of abracadabra rationalization process takes place, as a result, there is a language denial. Moreover, the governmental understanding of language via script also creates a language de denial. Therefore, the language list needs to be updated in a real sense, not through a bureaucratic understanding of language. At the same time, if you think of national education policy and census, we do lack of resources. This needs to be addressed because in order to address the issue of language endangerment, we need to create resources first so that they get identified in national education policy or in the census. And two of the important things that we find it very interestingly and what we are trying to do Someone is- Someone could, could, could you please conclude? Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Sorry to crash you. Yeah. And we do encourage, identify, and study. These three things are very important in a classroom to identify a student who belongs to a different indigenous community. We must encourage to identify that person to be con continued. Otherwise, there is a trend to identify with the Mediterranean language, culture, um, literature, or anything. At the same time, we also need a global program, but we need to be tailored to specific programs so that we can reach endangerment, de endangerment. So, our idea is to de-endanger rather than to just keep on working on with the endangerment issue. These are my references. And finally, Olumnike and Mahala. These are two words in Kulum and Bhujal to say thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Samar. You are doing very uh, commendable work and, and uh, we should congratulate you. And thanks for your very uh, uh, interesting presentation and, and sharing uh, your work on the, uh, on, on the indigenous languages uh, of uh, uh, Sikkim. Mm, thank you very much. And please stay for questions if there are any. Okay. The next presentation will be by, by Mr. Gunjal Likir Munda. He is again. We have this is another presentation we have from Anamaya uh, Tribal Health Collaborative, and uh, he is uh, actually his works include creation of Sur English Hindi dictionary, documentation of a Sur folklore, translating texts into Mundari language, etc. So he will be making presentation on challenges, implications and ethical considerations in translating cultural texts and knowledge-based literature off into 
uh, endangered indigenous language of Jharkhand and Arunachal Pradesh, a case study of Asur, Mundari, and Tangam languages. So please, Mr. Ganjur, uh, you have 10 minutes for your presentation. Yeah. Thank please. you, sir. Yeah, can I have the main slide, please? Okay, yeah. So before I start this presentation, uh, I mean, I'd like to thank the people who have helped me, uh, me myself, uh, and Kaling Dabi and Madhura Kevinder, who might, might be listening now uh, to this uh, whole presentation. And since we were three of us, we came up with quite a long uh, topic. But in short, uh, 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 whatever uh, I'll be going to speak about uh, is based on our experience uh, working on three languages. That's uh, Asur, uh, Mundari, uh, and the Tangam language. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, 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 to put things in, uh, uh, this is the map of uh, East India and Northeast India, uh, where we have a Tangam language uh, up in the Eastern Himalayas near the Tibet border. Uh, uh, the only village where Tangam is uh, being spoken now is uh, Kuging. Uh, it's in Upper Siang district in Arunachal uh, Pradesh, where we have only 253 speakers and uh, the status of the language is uh, critically endangered. Uh, in Eastern India, in the Chota Nagpur Plateau, we have Asur language in the Kumla district, about 7,000 speakers and the status is definitely endangered. And Mundari, uh, in the Rachi district of Jharkhand, we have around uh, uh, 12 black speakers and it is uh, potentially vulnerable. Next slide, please. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, we'll be sharing our experiences uh, from uh, the documentation of uh, Tangam, uh, where uh, uh, we did ethno-linguistic study, a documentary film. We actually brought out a few documentary film uh, by Karin Dabi, and uh, uh, they came up with scratch grammar. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so uh, these are a few pictures from the Tangam community. Uh, we are, we'll be also sharing our experiences from documenting the Asur language, uh, where we came up with a sketch grammar, uh, Asur English Hindi dictionary, folklore, uh, etc. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, the Asur community uh, was originally uh, iron smelting community and when we were working with them, we actually uh, came up with this idea of trying to revive the iron smelting technology on the left, on the, the photograph on the left side, you can see people have built this uh, small furnace after around uh, let's say 80 odd years, though we were not successful, but you know, it was a good experience uh, uh, between us and the community members where we actually tried to do something which their ancestors were so uh, good in doing some hundred years ago. And also uh, we'll be sharing our experiences from you know, translating uh, the preamble of the constitution into Mundari. So uh, basically we'll be sharing experiences from translating uh, text uh, from our indigenous languages, that's Asur and Tangam, and uh, 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 translating uh, text into uh, an English language, that's Mundari, uh, that uh, the experience we got from translating the preamble of the constitution into Mundari. Next slide, next slide please. Yeah, uh, yeah, so uh, that's the workshop where we were actually translating uh, the, uh, the preamble of the constitution into Mundari. And on the right hand side, we have uh, one of the, I mean, Munda community is one of the community which are, who, who are practicing uh, uh, monolithic culture. They uh, uh, like the, uh, uh, they place uh, these big stones uh, on the, on the uh, deceased people graves as a uh, sign of the remembrance. So it's one of the live cultures where uh, monoliths are still being used uh, uh, in India. So uh, our findings and the difficulties which we faced while translating from indigenous languages, uh, our experiences from uh, Asur and Tangam language. First of all, it's the, the lack of written records and uh, the people who have worked uh, on languages, uh, they might be knowing that it's a very tough job to actually 
uh, sit down and transcribe text. Uh, if there are none, there, there are no written records, then uh, around you know two minutes of voice recording it takes nearly an hour or, or so to actually transcribe. So uh, lack of written records is one of the major uh, challenges which we found while translating from indigenous languages. The linguistic structure is very different when we talk about uh, the indigenous language and we'll try to translate it into Hindi or English. Uh, we face difficulties while, you know, uh, since the do, both the languages have different linguistic structure, uh, we do have a loss of authenticity when we uh, try to translate it into English, although, uh, you know, we can come up with some side notes or footnotes. Uh, same can be said with the cultural context. Uh, uh, I mean, all the languages have their own cultural context from which uh, they they speak about or they share their experiences from. Uh, 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 different languages have different worldview and belief system. So, uh, I mean, if you translate something from indigenous language into English, uh, uh, definitely we will be requiring a lot of footnotes. Uh, ethical consideration, uh, sometimes uh, translation brings out text which uh, alters the meaning and it sometimes can be quite demeaning. Uh, for example, I do remember uh, people translating uh, supreme spirit or supreme being as uh, uh, when they translated it into Hindi in Mundari, uh, case of Mundari translation, then it translated into something like the God who eats uh, the rooster, something like that. So ethical consideration should be kept into mind while uh, trying to translate from indigenous languages and the language endangerment, because uh, this is one of the major concern from the indigenous communities, because once you bring out the translation, uh, since the indigenous people have been so trained into reading the mainstream languages that you know people sometimes or generally they uh, they skip over the original text and they prefer reading uh, the translated version into Hindi or English. So uh, this is one of the major concerns, uh, and also a debate is going on whether we should translate our texts or not. Uh, well, it's a it's another topic. Uh, uh, for uh, discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. And also uh, findings uh, when we translate into indigenous languages. Uh, we generally uh, have this difficulty of, you know, finding people who have uh, sufficient knowledge of both the languages. You know, it's really a tough job uh, to translate when you only know one language properly, you know, you need to know both, uh, suppose, uh, say, indigenous languages, and also know uh, uh, properly, either Hindi or English. Uh, uh, and uh, we do have people who, who are, you know, they don't have this basic training of translation. So they come up with many mistakes, you know, for example, you know, they generally try to, you know, make a one to one translation without, you know, understanding the meaning of uh, the sentences or the words. Uh, yeah, creation of supplementary text. I mean, this uh, problem we faced while uh, we were doing this workshop of translating the preamble of the, uh, of, uh, the constitution that, you know, we did feel that, you know, even one word, if we are coming up with a, a completely new word, let's say for democracy, or we're just taking the original word, that democracy as it is, then we do actually need to uh, make the people understand through supplementary text as to what this new word or the, or the original word meant in its historical context and uh, try to make people understand as to what this particular concept would mean in their own cultural setting. So it's quite, quite a lot of uh, uh, work and also taking different cultural context into uh, cultural things into context. Yeah, again, uh, we faced uh, this uh, this problem of you know of uh, uh, people had poor understanding of concepts, so we have few heavy words in the preamble like uh, democracy, fraternity, socialist, uh, etc. etc. Et so uh, in order for us to actually translate those things, we had to actually know what those words actually meant. Uh, so uh, people, we did have some poor understanding of things. Uh, and uh, dissemination and financial constraints. So uh, this is also another uh, major challenge which we uh, had faced and still facing uh, regarding you know, financial constraints as to when you try to employ people into 
uh, you know, working into this translation, they uh, have to kind of uh, let go of all the other works and put all their concentration and all their efforts in creating these texts. And also for dissemination, because you know, people only ten people getting together and uh, translating something and coming up something new for the community uh, is quite unfair. You know, you have to get the opinion of uh, people from across. Uh, different geography and different experiences. So dissemination is uh, quite important to get the feedback. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so suggestions, uh, uh, we think if we can work on these issues, probably uh, we can have a better translation and also better exchange of knowledge between different cultures. Uh, uh, increase talk about cultural sensitivity or competence uh, and linguistic diversity. Uh, this thing, all, although it might not be directly related to, you know, creating a quality translation, but it uh, it, it actually uh, puts, uh, uh, it, it actually encourages, you know, uh, translation and also it actually uh, gives some impetus to, uh, for the people to actually know about others, others' culture and at the same time, uh, people are encouraged to translate uh, things, ideas, uh, and try to understand the other culture. Uh, the other thing which we felt is that, you know, we do need to have uh, a basic understanding or a, at least a basic course of linguistics being taught in school. Uh, I mean, in India, uh, linguistics is currently being taught only at in few selected universities and that too at either BA or MA level. But uh, I mean, basic linguistics just so as to uh, put in a sense of uh, linguistic diversity and also the basic scientific understanding of uh, language. We do need to have linguistics in school. Mother tongue based primary education is another point uh, which will actually encourage uh, more translation from and into indigenous languages. Uh, acknowledging indigenous people and their language, uh, uh, many times uh, the state or even uh, other community, they uh, don't acknowledge uh, the indigenous people and their language uh, and you know, kind of uh, disregard and say that these languages, they don't have their own, uh, you know, uh, kind of grammar and, you know, these are third grade languages and, uh, and so on. So at least uh, uh, things should begin from acknowledging uh, the presence of the indigenous people and their language. Uh, we do need to have some technological intervention because uh, having nearly 700 you know, different communities in a, and trying to come up with translations uh, by forming groups in all these languages for a sustained period of time, it's very difficult to do things manually. So we have uh, new technologies like, you know, uh, use of AI and other things, which where we can put in data and then uh, come up with a, a shorter way to actually translate things. And uh, we do need to, uh, to have indigenous people train in translation. That's important because uh, indigenous people, while they're working uh, in their own language, uh, they have a better uh, sense of understanding about the culture, about the context. So uh, these are the points which uh, we try to come up as suggestions uh, if you are talking about uh, increasing the quality of translation and the quantity. Uh, next slide, slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and. We had two more words uh, from our indigenous languages. One was Johar, and I'm forgetting the other one. So uh, thank you very much once again. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Vinjal, for uh, more or less keeping the time. And you have made very good sections which are applicable to other indigenous languages. So thank you for your interesting presentation. Before moving to the next presentation, just I would like to suggest uh, the following. Since we are running out of time, uh, I request those who have already made presentation. There are uh, questions, clarifications in the chat box, for example, to Tejas and Hero and others. So you please try to answer them in the chat, chat box. The next um, presentation will be uh, on, uh, it, it will be on, Empowering Poya community, especially children and youth, through propagation of literature in Poya language by Yadaya Ganga Devi, and uh, has been working on the on the on the on the in this area for last thirty years, making a very good uh, uh, number of uh, publications and also collecting information 
about Koya people. So now the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Yadaygar. You have 10 minutes, sir, for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, hello, so everyone. Yeah, hello, we can everyone. hear you. Uh, we can hear you. Please, please start. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a very pleasurable moment for me to actually share our experiences and the work which we do on this uh, in important day, like uh, International Indigenous Day. So, thanks for inviting me for this thing. Thanks for translations, comments, Samta, UNESCO, and all uh, my well wishers. This is uh, basically working with the Koya community. This title of my presentation is Empowering Koya Community, especially children and youth through propagation of literature in Koya language. I represent a community based organization called Koyatrubata, which we have started in early 2000s. Uh, this is alumni of our own students who got educated through our bridge courses. So, uh, for 13 years, we did conducted uh, a bridge course for 15 to 25 year tribal youth, Adivasi youth, that is from Koya, those are Koyas, Kondareddis and Nagpods. And since then, we have started working on this language. Kondareddi, they speak a dialect of Telugu. Nagpod language is not existence in that area or in any area now. Koyas, it's a Koya is a dialect of Gordi. So this particular dialect is spoken in these four state bordering states of Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Chhattisgarh, and Orissa. That most of this area now is going to be affected by uh, upcoming Polavaram project also. So the basic pedagogy of our work is we do conduct a series of workshops to generate new poetry in that language, especially focusing on rhymes and poems and songs. When we began our program, community choirs used to say that we have only rela, adult rela songs accompanied by bison or drummers, but we don't have anything special for children. And it took for us to even to imbibe that idea into the community. It took three years to get that idea into their heads. Slowly, they started acknowledging it. We started through actually transliterating from Telugu. And then that process took us to the Koya creation. I am a, myself is a writer in Telugu language. I do write poetry for children, especially. That base gave me an so uh, a better advantage to work with this community. So when we started, people were reluctant. They used to say, we don't have anything. From that onwards, by 2005, we were able to come out with some literature. So our bridge courses have stopped by 2013 because of fun crunch. But the work which we have started, we have not stopped that work. We started continuing it. And uh, since 2020, uh, we are actually getting support from Samta. I'm very much thankful for them to support us at, very, at a crucial time. So now, so we, we for uh, throughout these 20 years, we might have conducted around at least 30 workshops. So uh, uh, during 2005 to 7, I was a consultant to Dr. Edis Foundation, where they were having some uh, this tribal program in that area. But I pushed them to take up this language aspect because of my interest. That, ang that also actually worked as a bridge to sustain our effort. So after 2007, they stopped working on that area or on that subject. So. We are now focusing in three mandals in that area. That is 
Chintur, Vyarpuram and Punavaram. That is a very, uh, it's a like a very linking area to Chhattisgarh, to Odisha and to Telangana and to Andhra Pradesh. That dialect actually now the people, now we have through these workshops, why I'm emphasizing on workshops is oh, workshop model is the pedagogy of our spread, of our creation. We are creating the lit bank for this children's literature. Now, at least we can actually say that more than 100 poems are being propagated in that area. So two language volunteers, they go school to school, hostel to hostel every day, at least two schools in a day. And that is actually, whenever our volunteers go there, children just, they are actually with enthralled with the language, they play just, and they're dancing. And the entire atmosphere in the school is different now. So they are accept, accepting it from the children. They are actually taking this to the community. We are hoping that when the displacement happens, is happening also, these children and the community, they carried this language to the newer areas where they will be re relocated. That language actually keeps them as a uh, lifeline with the older areas. Because as many of you might be knowing, this Polavaram project is going to inundate 368 villages. Koya villages are more than 200. They are not only in uh, Andhra, Chalangana, but they are in Chhattisgarh and Odisha also. Even uh, regarding Chhattisgarh and Odisha, there is no even proper assessment of how much area will be inundated, how many villages be inundated. There is no proper survey also. But that, that is a broader uh, threat for the community. And uh, uh, frequent floods are also this thing. And as you know, because of the barrier which is created among this, because all of them relate, related, whether the Chhattisgarh, Odisha or Andhra, but because of the state ba barrier, if they go out to one state or other state, they don't get cash certificates, tribal identity. Most of the people who actually displaced from Chhattisgarh, who entered into Telangana and Andhra also, they are facing a problem of the, getting the certificates. It's a broader area. But confining myself to language area, this language is actually a booster, not only for the internal identity, but also a link to communicate with their own people across the borders, whether they are from Odisha. And when we are actually seeing this now children, when, uh, as we know, they go for relatives plays and rituals and uh, 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 what do we say, weekly sandies, they do meet a lot of other people. So this language is spreading. And uh, so we, especially the kind of literature, and not only rhymes, but we're actually developing stories also and collecting uh, these two parts. Collecting is one part, creation is another part. I can say so far our creation is we are one focusing on creating more uh, because they are not having this children's literature in this language. The kind of richness which other language is having, we are trying to bring in this thing to throw the workshops. What is a workshop? This is an interested youth, whether college-going youth or dropouts or adults, they come to the, a place. We have a place, and uh, so this Koyatrubata has a place to actually do these workshops also. So there we sit for at least five days at a stretch and focus on creating new, new things. After that, we do go for field testing, go to the adults and seek their advice, update them and go back. As you are seeing in these visuals, these children, these volunteers go there and actually uh, recite those uh, things. And what we are finding is earlier when the indigenous day happens, that we have a, a special occasion for language also. And with at many places, youth came forward to celebrate this. They call uh, Vishwakoya Dinotsava. That is universal. With euphoria, they call it Universal Koya Day. At more than 30 places, youth came forward to celebrate this occasion. And in between this, you are seeing one wedding court, which is in, uh, which is in the middle of this slide. Even the wedding invitations, they started printing in, in their language. Earlier, they used to use Telugu. 
even the script is telugu but the language is koya that change is appearing now sir sir you have one minute time sir sorry to cross you yeah yeah it's okay uh, now today it's a uh, 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 lucky to actually get this news item in hindu uh, visa garrison where it was covered this uh, article has covered what we are this this uh, woman called bimamma she is a first generation educated she is now she wrote more than 40 poems in her language some are very popular now and uh, it's like these people uh, the young uh, now they are also 30 plus some are 40 plus also Uh, the people who actually got into this koya language promotion work 20 years back they are there along with them now new generation of people they count for they came forward and take it in it further so at the end what i am saying is people say we don't have generally they what i am finding with adivasi is they generally they start with the daniel only Don't don't pester us. Don't eat our brains. We don't have. They say that if you consistently walk with them, they start actually. Oh, it takes time. They open up and start communicating to you. And now, when we started translating for only few poems, they translated. After that, she they kept this thing. I said, sir, now we go, we know what to do. So okay, we'll write our own. So now the new uh, styles. Which cannot be translated into Telugu other language, they are coming up, they are surfacing. The kind of things which they have forgotten long back, now the even older people they are recollecting it, they are sharing with us. Uh, recently, we have found oh, oh, old two rhymes which were very famous then, but they were regarded as adult thing. Of late, when we are working with the children, we found that it is the children's rhyme. Which is very good, which is very rhythmic, and when the analysis put before this use, yes, yes, sir, this is children's literature only. It's not that we don't have; it is that off it from lost uh, so two hundred years or so. When this uh, Telugu medium or this other schools came, we started keeping our own language at a bay. Now they have taken this to the on their shoulders. It's going ahead; they are going further. So we want to actually. do it in more number of villages because we have only two volunteers we are able to cover few villages it has to be spread and uh, the other dialects for example the is is koya is a part of larger gondi dialect this can be easily sir, translated into other dialects of gondi sir request like you to conclude thank you yeah yeah, yeah. thank you uh, yeah, thank you thank you all uh, we are now we are ending with our own slogan where spelling people speak koya and save koya and for the thank you thank you thank sir you. for your wonderful work you are doing for so many years so patiently so thank you very much and the presentation is very very interesting to know how koya is being we, uh, what are the efforts that you are making to save koya language to protect koya language now we will move to the next presentation by dr maya kemlani De david uh, from Uh, University of Malay, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and uh, received a uh, award. Dr. Maya received the award, Lingua Fox Award for research on language maintenance and revitalization, and uh, she has published widely on minority languages in Malaysia. Has focused on Sindhi Hindu community in diaspora. She and Dr. Maya is going to make presentation on. Digital productions of Malaysian indigenous communities. So, Dr. Maya, the floor is yours, and you have ten minutes time. I am uh, Maya David from University of Malaysia, and I would like to share with you some of the work of young indigenous people in Malaysia. First, to just provide you a little bit of background of the indigenous people in Malaysia. We have West Malaysia and East Malaysia, so the orang asli of indigenous people in in Malaysia is very diverse. There are officially nineteen ethnic 
some groups. They are classed as Negrito, Sanoi, or Proto Malay in Peninsular Malay, Malaysia. But in East Malaysia, we have 64 indigenous groups, that is around 39 in Sabah and 25 in Sarawak. In East Malaysia, they are known as Orang Asa, whereas in Peninsular Malaysia, they are known as Orang Asli. And they, in, uh, in East Malaysia, they make up 60% of Sabah's population and 50% of Sarawak's population, the two states in East Malaysia. The three largest indigenous groups in Sabah are the Kadazan Dusu, the Bajau, and the Murut. Moving on to indigenous youth in Malaysia, youth are deemed to be youth if they are between 15 to 30 years of age. Youth, of course, bring with them a lot of incredible great deal of incredible drive and commitment to change things for the better. So it's important to utilize young people's potential as powerful agents of change. In Malaysia, out of a population of about 36 million, we have about 200,000 indigenous people belonging to different communities. Let me now move on to showcase some of work done by Malaysian Indigenous youth. Much of the work that the youth do is through social media like YouTube, Facebook and so on. Indigenous youth as agents of change, I'm going to share with you a YouTube movie done by uh, the Indigenous people of Uh, I apologize for the quality of the audio. I would like to let everyone know that uh, the video is available on YouTube for you to watch. Uh, we will try to enhance the audio and uh, we, we hope that uh, you will enjoy it at a later day. And also we hope to host uh, uh, Maya at our next event where we can have a, a more clear audio. Uh, Prabhakar, back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now we will move to the last presentation of this session by Dev Kumar. He is the chairperson, Indigenous Television Nepal. And uh, he has written extensively on international human rights and issues concerning indigenous people in various media and channels. So now the floor is uh, for to Mr. Dev Kumar. Mr. Dev Kumar, you have 10 minutes. So, go quaint Dev Kumar Sunwar. Nelim Tal Seota, Seopata. Greetings. Uh, first of all, on the occasion of International Day of World's Indigenous Peoples, I would like to extend my best wishes to all brothers and sisters from across the world. This year, uh, we are highlighting the role of indigenous youth in preserving and protecting the rights of indigenous peoples, especially in the realization of uh, indigenous peoples' right to self-determination. The uh, United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was adopted in the year 2007, uh, is one of the most comprehensive international legal instrument associated with indigenous peoples. As enshrined a uh, right to uh, self-determination as the fundamental uh, rights of indigenous peoples. The Article 3 of the uh, UN DRIP or UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples states the on the basis of rights of indigenous uh, rights uh, right to self determination indigenous peoples freely determine their uh, political status and uh, pursue their economic social and cultural cultural development which is established based on the rights of uh, right to self determinations 
similarly, the uh, declaration also includes several uh, articles uh, related to right to self determinations. If you look into Article 4, which highlights that indigenous peoples have a right to autonomy and right to self-government in matters related to their internal and local affairs, as well as uh, the right to have a means to finance their autonomous uh, functions. And uh, similarly, the Article 5, 8, 20, and 24 of the UN DRIP establishes that uh, indigenous peoples right to preserve, strengthen, and develop their uh, own institutions uh, for decision-making and uh, for their own legal, economic, cultural, and social systems. And uh, there is no doubt that young indigenous peoples play a, a critical role in decision-making processes of indigenous peoples addressing uh, disinformations, uh, including climate change, which uh, disproportionately impact indigenous peoples and uh, equally indigenous youth play uh, a critical role in the preservations, protections and a promotion of language and the indigenous cultures. They contribute not only to protecting uh, and uh, transferring the indigenous knowledge of uh, their elders but also bringing new ideas and approaches in preserving and protecting them. We also uh, should not forget that indigenous youth uh, not only are the future, but also are the partners of today. Therefore, we must uh, be able to amplify the voice and the role that indigenous youth play uh, in, 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 in this century. When I was young, I myself uh, have actively laid the campaigns and now uh, I have been engaging uh, the uh, youth in each and every campaigns and movement of indigenous, indigenous peoples. For example, for the last couple of years, I, together with uh, Sunwar Welfare Society and Umbrella Organization of Sunwar, uh, indigenous peoples of Nepal, uh, together with translation commons, involving young uh, Sunuar and Sunuar linguists and activists, uh, we are trying to digitalize uh, the Sunuar script. And we have a hope uh, to have the Unicode uh, of the Sunuar script uh, at the end of this year. And uh, together with, uh, we are also making a forward to uh, develop a computer fund uh, for a Sunwar script and also uh, create digital uh, database and also educational resources for uh, learning the script as an effort to advance the international decade of indigenous languages, which uh, started from the year 2022. Therefore, um, uh, what I believe is the investment on youth uh, today will certainly contribute to the holistic development of uh, the whole society of indigenous peoples. Therefore, uh, there is a need to uh, introduce uh, some plans and programs to inform young uh, indigenous peoples about the global, national and local issues and concerns that uh, affect them and their communities. Because uh, uh, the indigenous youth can make a louder voice and also raise a greater awareness uh, about the issues and concerns that affect them and their community. And equally, they uh, also can shape the future of their communities. And also there is a need of a program to empower uh, indigenous youth uh, by helping them to organize and mobilize them because the future of uh, right to self-determinations of indigenous peoples actually depends on the work of indigenous youth. Uh, they are the ones uh, who will carry out the tradition, language, and the cultures of their ancestors. Therefore, we must be able to increase their access and the control 
over the resources. And uh, we must be able to involve them with their meaningful representations in the governance of all political, uh, social and cultural institutions. At last, uh, I hope uh, the theme of this year's International Day of World's Indigenous Peoples uh, be able to help inform, involve, and empower indigenous youth in the larger agenda of uh, indigenous peoples of the globe. And at last, I would like to thank Translation Commons and UNESCO for this opportunity to speak of on the occasion of this year's um, theme of International Day of World Indigenous Peoples. Thank you. Namaste. See you. Thank you, Mr. Dev Kumar, for your uh, wonderful presentation and also making it well in time. Thank you very much. Now we have questions collected from the YouTube. I will quickly read. And these questions have been collected by Soumya. The question is for Tejas. Tejas, you have a question. Are you there? Tejas, are you there? Um. He should be there, but uh, otherwise, like I'm uh, there, uh, his colleague. Yeah, so you are there, please, right? So, yeah, yeah. so there is a question from Ye Holland uh, that uh, with so many tribal languages and such a wide range of locations, is there a plan to educate and disperse the information to the most rural areas and address the need for transportation to medical events? So you please complete within two minutes. Please. Yes, Please. sure, sure, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, like uh, my colleague they just shared, the program uh, so far, like the Ashwasan campaign that we have implemented, the health messaging along with that is implemented across 174 tribal districts. And the priority was uh, in the blocks, which are uh, you know particularly remote and had like you know more than 50% uh, of tribal populations. So the work uh, and the intervention operational design is already um, uh, carried out in a manner so that it suits the remote and uh, you know inaccessible areas. Moving forward, uh, like uh, outlined by uh, Tejas, in the 75 districts where we are working towards you know contributing to making the districts like free from the impact of TB. There also the areas are um, not like closer to the district town or closer to the uh, block headquarter area. We primarily work in the remote areas itself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I hope that uh, the, 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 the answer is well addressed. The question is well addressed. Now, the second question is to Hero and his team by Yuli Anderson. Uh, the question is about uh, language offices in India. And uh, the team has sent me the answer. I am reading it. Language offices have some duties related to Indonesian and indigenous local languages and literature. The main duties are to mapping, vitalization, conversation, revitalization, and registration of registration indigenous languages in India. These languages are local units of the National Language Agency under the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research and Technology. Each language office is responsible to the list uh, every indigenous language within its working territory. It is later on responsible to conduct studies and development in collaboration with academia, local government, and native speakers on the languages. So this decentralization approach enables us to address all languages, although, of course, will not be in the same degree due to lack of financial support and human resources. So this is the answer provided to Anderson by the by Hero, Hero and his team. Now there is a question from Soumya to Yadaya Garo. Uh, the question is, current state of traditional ways of learning among the Koya community, are Gotul still in practice? Should these ways also be preserved and revitalized? So Yadaya Garo, please. Okay. Uh, regarding this uh, traditional way of uh, learning, uh, actually earlier I have answered, uh, uh, one thing is in this, uh, uh, it was in existence long back. 
so now it is not there some efforts are being made here and there uh, with uh, indigenous groups uh, independent uh, uh, this uh, so political groups among adivasis they are trying but as we know now that uh, as the change changes it's very difficult to actually reconstruct as it was so now the media cell phones have inter- actually came into existence and other things uh, we have to see maybe a, uh, we don't know how it will go ahead um, i'm not sure but to answer that question maybe we we need to uh, look more into kind of a thing of uh, like people say in abujmad area still godil is there but i'm not sure in how it is in this political crisis it's hap- it's surviving or not surviving but in our area it used to existence uh, it's already this gen uh, almost uh, it uh, yeah now people have forgotten it uh, so i think uh, i'm not sure how it will go thank you sir thank you now there is a question from uh, perumal sami to mr gunzal are you available mr gunzal yes yes sir i am available yeah 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 now the question is like this number of indigenous languages declared uh, declared as official languages of sikkim uh, they are the first state to give such status i would like to know whether they are top medium of instruction in primary level sir please in 2 minutes yeah well i think uh, that's uh, for dr samar sina to answer probably because he was the one who presented yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the yeah if dr samar is there then we can uh, chip in probably thank you gunjal yeah. um in fact in sikkim uh, once your language is recognized as state official languages uh, primary education uh, services are provided however there are problems because the textbook offices are not ready this is the case with the bujal language bujal language got recently recognized as state language but there there is no person to be appointed directly as a textbook officer so there are certain issues like that however uh, overall if you look into the case that there these languages are taught in fact in my university sikkim university we have got three languages which are endangered languages and they are taught only in at the university level in the world and we are the only university where we have department of bhutia lepcha and limbu where endangered languages the whole entire course from ma to phd is uh, a phd is in these three languages of course in colleges in sikkim we do have uh, these languages three languages also apart from that they are uh, at different levels some of them are up to primary level some of them are higher secondary level and some of them are in college but these three languages are taught in uh, masters program as well as in phd in fact the whole program runs in that endangered languages so this situation is uh, pretty uh, different than in other but of course we still need to work more on the languages over here i think thank that's you, what thank, thank you dr samad yeah i thank all the participants uh, all the paper presenters for their wonderful presentations this once again show the the need for revitalization of indigenous languages and also have translations from major languages into indigenous languages thank you very much i also thank jenit for giving me this opportunity now the floor is yours then thank you very much uh, wonderful presentations and excellent job uh, in moderating thank you everyone so much our closing address is going to be by mr tex texan he is globalization architect and on the board of direct of advisors of translation commons uh, uh tex is an industry thought leader specializing in software globalization services tex has contributed to several internationalization standards and open source software and has been an advisor to several globalization on profit he's an advisor to translation commons where he has been architecting our language digitization initiative bringing the languages of indigenous communities to digital systems tex thank you so much the floor is yours thank you janette and uh hello everyone um i because we're running over time i'm going to cut my remarks back 
quite a bit. And so uh, you may thank me for that and maybe also forgive me uh, if my thoughts now seem a little bit more uh, scattered or uh, indirect uh, because I'm making these uh, comments all on the fly. Um, I do want to remark what an amazing event. Uh, speaking for myself, I enjoyed the cultural presentations and I have learned quite a bit um, about indigenous Asian cultures. Um, I also have several takeaways uh, from the many speakers. There were so many that I can't mention them all. Um, and if our audience would also uh, like to share their takeaways that were significant to them, perhaps you can add them in the chat um, or comments on YouTube. What were the highlights for yourselves? What resonated with you? Uh, we can collect them all and share them with the speakers and, and perhaps on our website. Um, in fact, uh, if we move to the next slide that has all of the links, um, I'm sorry, go one more and then we'll come back to this. Um, so these are the many different ways uh, that you can talk to Translation Commons on social media. And this could be a good place. Any one of those would be a good way for you to share uh, the takeaways that you have. Um, for myself, there were several things that, that resonated um, with me. Um, first of all, it is great to hear about uh, the progress we have made in translating information to indigenous languages, um, to see that uh, information, whether it was health or science or children's uh, education being translated into, for example, more than 100 languages, um, that is tremendous progress. And then at the same time, uh, it's amazing that we could still be missing 600 languages for, a re for that same region. There is still so much more work to do, but still it is good to be making that progress. Um, and uh, it seems that we also need, we learned and that we also need to take our translation to the next level, not to just have literal translations, but to have more localization of the content um, to be able to represent um, in information for which uh, there aren't words in the indigenous language. They have to be created, they have to be presented um, with additional information to explain them and define them. So there is still much work to be done. Uh, we also uh, were informed to be aware of uh, stereotypes um, and how the media represents indigenous peoples um, in the media. And uh, for myself, I tend to watch some older uh, television shows and movies, and sometimes I'm just shocked, even only a few years ago, to see how certain peoples are represented. Um, and uh, that's something that we need to be aware of. It's, it's also something that's constantly changing in society as we move, um, uh, as populations become more familiar to people. Um, so, and we learned quite a bit about the importance of language and culture to maintain communities, especially against uh, the various forces that are trying to divide communities, whether it's um, displacement or other factors, uh, but it is very important um, that we enable youth uh, to have, to, to learn their language and culture, have writing systems and so forth in order to preserve knowledge and give youth uh, the awareness and the ability to fight for the rights for self-rule. So these were all um, important topics. And yet at the same time, we touched on the dilemma of bringing indigenous languages to the mainstream. Uh, and the, an example was given of the appropriation of music, uh, for example, um, the creation of, of disco uh, dimsa dancing, which um, on the one hand, uh, it becomes uh, a part of the mainstream. On the other hand, the dimsa dancing also uh, gets modified uh, by the by the way the mainstream treats it. Uh, we also had the other example of the 
Mawa drink. Um, and as this becomes popular in the mainstream, uh, it isn't being brought, any value or benefit isn't being brought back to the community. Um, and so that's something that uh, needs to be considered and, and somehow managed. Um, I was also, uh, of course, very glad to hear about the importance of, of writing and the creation um, of keyboards and terminology uh, lists or dictionaries. Uh, this is, of course, very important uh, to Translation Commons. It's a part of our work uh, to create uh, keyboards for indigenous cultures uh, and also to work on terminology and other aspects of language digitization. Um, and not only the, the uh, writing, but the importance of preserving culture. Um, I enjoyed hearing the poetry and the music. And this is also an important way to educate um, within a culture. And I, I think it's often subtle um, and even subliminal in a way for a culture to be uh, not only preserved, but to educate people. Um, it, it describes the identity of people. Um, it cements their identity in, in, their, in their minds. But we were given the example of, of young children being aware of the different kinds of mushrooms and uh, which ones were safe to eat and which ones were poisonous. And what I find is a lot of the uh, songs and fables that we teach children often encapsulate that kind of information in a way that is easily digestible by children. And because it is the, these stories are adapted and native to the region, the stories that are passed on help uh, people survive in their environment. And so it's important to, to capture that. Um, any of us that have uh, children or grandchildren, uh, and we read these stories uh, to our kids, um, we, we're not always aware of the, the subtle information that's being provided. So a simple story like Hansel and Gretel um, is communicating quite a bit about uh, danger of, of talking to strangers and what can happen. So uh, there was so much information here. I'll, I'll, I'll stop with my remarks, but um, I, I do think um, we, we learned quite a bit and there's a lot of progress that has been made. Um, but uh, there, is all, there is still quite a lot to do and to understand about um, preserving and uh, working with indigenous cultures. So um, I would also like to uh, mention that for this event, uh, we recognized many, but certainly not all indigenous cultures of South and Southeast Asia. Um, Translation Commons has intentions to create events uh, recognizing more cultures and cultures of other regions as well. If you are interested in helping with this, let us know via the um, social media that we've listed there. Um, as you know, Translation Commons is entirely volunteer-based nonprofit organization. So our volunteers are very influential driving the activities we create, and you can help create events or topics um, where your interest lies. So uh, come and join us, uh, come help us and, and contribute um, and uh, talk to us on the social media uh, that suits you that are listed here. Um, so in celebration of International Translation Day, um, and if we can go back one slide, thank you. Um, we have another event coming up September 30th. Um, in honor of um, International Translation Day. And uh, its theme is Unveiling the Many Faces of Humanity, Translation and Interpret Interpretation in Indigenous Languages. We are uh, sponsored for this event by UNESCO and the International Decade of Indigenous Languages, and of course, hosted by Translation Commons as well. Um, the details will be announced shortly. Um, as you know, we hosted a terrific event last year 
that was uh, well attended. It received many accolades. This year, we intend to exceed that success. If you follow our social media, you will receive announcements with the details. And you can also watch videos from last year's event on our YouTube channel. Look for the playlist uh, that is uh, called ITD um, or International Translation Day 2022. So um, on behalf of Translation Commons, I would like to thank all of our speakers and the many volunteers that worked so hard behind the scenes uh, today for several and for several months to bring this event together. Um, and uh, these folks will also be continuing to make the videos and slides available to everyone. Um, I won't read all of the names, uh, but our heartfelt appreciation to everyone that contributed. Um, you may be surprised by the number of people that were involved in producing this event. It's, it's quite a lot of work um, and we had excellent help and, and high quality uh, production uh, for all of uh, all of this event. Um, so uh, with that, uh, we'll close the event. Uh, however, our work on the International Decade of Indigenous Languages is ongoing. Uh, and with your help, we look forward to continuing this effort and marking our progress next year and every year on this date until we can host the event with simultaneous interpretation and transcription in many indigenous languages. Thank you all for attending and for your support. Jeanette, back to you. Uh, thank you, everyone. This is the end of the online event. And as Tex said, we hope to see you at our next event on September 30th. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.